He always does, yeah. Uh, good morning, everybody. I am Mariela, president of a student chapter of Simbestab Zacatenco. It is a pleasure to me giving you a warm welcome to this course entitled TM and STM, the ultimate imaging and analyze tool for today and tomorrow's nanotechnology. In this time, we, we have the great pleasure to hear Dr. Kevin McGrath. He's the TM technical application specialist from Geol USA. I am pretty sure that the knowledge with the Dr. McGrath is going to share great out. We'll cover some aspects of great interest for all. I invite you to enjoy and take advantage of this course, which is one of a kind. In addition, I want to say that this course is organized by the Sociedad Mexicana de Materiales in collaboration with Geol Mexico and the student chapter of Sinvestad Zacatenco of Mexico City. He gives you Dr. Patricia Zambrano, which president of Sociedad Mexicana de Materiales, is going to give a word. Thanks, Mariela. Very thank you. Thank you a lot. Uh, their, partic their, their participants, thank you for connecting to the special course. We will be, be her very happy to have your participation today. This course was jointly organized by Geol, Simbestab Zacatenco Student Chapter and Material Research Society in Mexico. For us, it's an honor that uh, our, um, our students have this type of initiative. A special thanks to Joel and Leopoldo Enriquez uh, for, uh, for bringing to, to this knowledge to society. And Mariela Hernandez from Simbestad Zacatenco Student Chapter for this excellent organization. And to, to our vice, vice president, Dr. Jesus Gonzalez from Simbestad Querétaro, that stay here with, with us. Thank you, thank you to all. Very, very, very thanks. Thank you, Mariela. Thank you, Dr. Asambrano. On behalf of Joel, I would like to introduce my dear friend, Kevin. He's our TM specialist that has been working with Joel for many, many years. Uh, he will kindly uh, help us to make a small course about TM. So I would like to uh, thank you everyone for your interest on this course. Uh, our colleague Natalia will give you a, a small resume about Kevin. Thank you. Thank you, Leopoldo. Good morning, everyone. My name is Natalia Guadiana Ramirez, Secretary of this student's chapter. I'm very happy to introduce you to this course speaker, Kevin McIlrath. Kevin McIlrath has been the Yale Team Applications Group since 2010 as a TEM STEM application scientist and has been in the industry for over 26 years. Michael Red has an extensive background in both materials and biological applications, co-authoring over 20 journal papers, giving talks at various meetings in North and South America, and taught the 10 STEM tomography section in Lehigh University's analytical electron microscopy course. He also supports customer training, demonstration, and application development of GL 10 STEM product line. Aside from this experience, Kevin McElrath is involved in the development of 10 STEM applications in both the material science and biological sciences fields with a focus on C corrections, as well as 10 STEM analytical electron tomography. Before we start, I would like to remind you to keep your microphones shut during the lecture. And if you have any questions, please write in on the chat. This will be answered in the, during the break. Without further ado, please join me in giving a warm welcoming to Kevin McElrath. Kevin. Uh, thank you, Natalia um, and um, Mariella, Patricia, and Polo for that. Um, okay, so um, before I start, let me just say uh, thank you for attending. I hope you're all healthy and well during this um, pretty rough year. Um, I'm at Delta College in California. This is actually right by my house, and so like five minutes away. So I'm actually sitting in a TEM lab and I'll be doing the presentation from the lab actually in the back because I can lock my door and not wear a mask. And so that's, although I'm supposed to. Um, so let me share my screen and I'll kind of go through um, what I'm gonna do. And I'm, I'm gonna do everything on this microscope for the lab. So um, 
let's start up and hopefully everything goes well. I've got a lot of slides. I'm going to go through things very fast. I wanted to cover a really broad range of um, applications and, and topics about TEM from the historical perspective to kind of what's currently going on in some future stuff and give you an idea on how we align these things. And some of the imaging techniques we'll also try to do in the lab um, portion. Now I'm on 120 KV lab six. It's not an analytical tool. It's more of a, um, there's no EDS detector. It's more of a, um, just an imaging tool and it's a teaching tool at where I'm at. So now we will have the lecture be about an hour and a half. We'll have some time for questions and answers and then uh, maybe a 15 minute break so we can all um, have a drink of water or something. And I am here at Delta College. Um, I attended this program when I was 18 after I graduated high school, but then I was very young. So I left and went lifeguarding in Hawaii for a year on the beach. I came back in 1992 after studying biology at Fresno State, and then I started my EM in, um, business in 1994. I joined um, another Japanese company as a TEM product application engineer, and I was responsible for North America, TEM, STEM, and single beam FIB. At age 30, I was sent to Japan to work in a Japanese factory, which was the fact company I worked for, um, learning materials characterization because my background's biology, and I was at Hitachi's factory actually in uh, Japan. During that one year, I spent three months in TEM assembly, building TEMs. Um, a lot of cleaning, uh, it's kind of boring, but it, it was interesting. And then in 2010, I joined Joel USA as a TEM STEM application scientist. And I'm kind of uh, strange in the sense that I, I do both materials and biological science. Um, so most companies have dedicated um, doc doctors for material science or for biological. I kind of float around. So um, the course outline. So we're going to go through a historical perspective. And what was sent out, I think, if you had seen the, the lecture outline before, there's things that are very critical that I wanted to get into before theory, design, and what we're doing. And that would be sample preparation. If you don't have a good sample, everything is going to be hard, no matter whether it's an optical scope, an electron microscope. Sometimes it's just easier to make another sample and then don't waste your time spending three, four hours trying to make something happen. Now, holders and stages are very critical. There's a lot of big changes. Um, and then digital imaging, that's another thing before we really kind of see what's going on with the microscope. And then I'll cover a little bit of theory and design of lenses and what's going on with the column. Um, and we'll go through just a little bit of alignment, just kind of what normally is done on a daily basis. And then I'll show you that on the microscope. And we'll look at a little bit of diffraction, some dark field imaging, TM analysis, not a big thing often, but, um, and then we'll go into STEM and look at resolution, Rocky Graham, and some of the imaging techniques. And then we'll look at analysis and tomography, tychography, which are more of these higher end applications. For the lab tutorial, I have two samples that we'll do a number of techniques on like <clears throat> alignment, bright field imaging, uh, diffraction, looking at seabed, polycrystal and single crystal, dark field. And if we have time, tomography, I can at least show you kind of how it's set up and what's done. <clears throat> so the historical view of this patient develop, I'll cover basic TM design. And um, the TEM stem offers many imaging and analytical techniques to choose from. Often your sample though will dictate what experimental setup is required for the results necessary to characterize your material. <clears throat> if you do not have a certain accessory, like I'm showing some very high-end imaging filters, cameras, that's fine because you can get 80% of probably what you want <clears throat> off of a kind of a standard basic microscope without having to delve into these extreme high-end stuff. But it's also nice to know if I go to like LL Nano in Brazil or somewhere else, it's nice for me to check that sample and make sure that when I go use a different microscope, I'm using a good sample. <clears throat> so the samples for the um, for the um, course, one, I have a nanoparticle demo sample. These are 15, nano, 15 nanometer particles that a company sent to me used for um, magnification calibration. They're very homogenous. And so we'll look at those and do a number of things. Um, the second sample, which I currently have in the microscope, is a single crystal alternating silicon, silicon germating multilayer called a Magical sample. And it's one of the best calibration samples 
because it allows you to look at a lot of different um, modes of the microscope. <clears throat> and it's a very expensive sample. So uh, we'll look at that. And this is kind of what it looks like. So we have these alternating silicon germanium layers. And these even split down further. So this will allow us to characterize things from low mag to high mag. Now, like I said, I'm at San Joaquin Delta College in California, Stockton. Um, it's one of the only microscopy program schools in the world, and it's been around since 1970. Anybody can come here. You just have to really have a high school diploma. They offer degrees in electron microscopy. So I see these people at labs all over the world. Another thing that I, I, I teach at usually in the summer is the beginning of summer, another one of the biggest microscopy schools in the US or the biggest actually is Lehigh Microscopy. And they offer the first week of June, a week long course in SEM, TEM, FIB, a number of different things. It's a great course. This year they may um, do things online. I think it's still being decided. And then again, if you want to follow up, I think it's twenty or thirty dollars to join this year's um, my M some M and M meeting uh, remotely, and that'll be August first to the fifteenth, with speakers like Hyder, Rose, that and uh, Kravonic that did um, you know have their own correct they built um, CS correctors. <clears throat> and so let's just dig in right now. Uh, I'm going to go through this really fast. I apologize if it's too fast sometimes, but I want to cover a lot. And I'll try to monitor my time. So what is TEM? TEM, or what is microscopy, right? <clears throat> microscopy has been around. I mean, we, we've wanted to magnify things that ever since we've actually been able to see, which is really since the beginning of the time, there's advantages to being able to see things at higher resolution and get a better understanding of what's happening. <clears throat> now, microscopy is one of the few tools that's really in every field of science and technology today. I mean, it really, from optical scopes to scanning microscopes to uh, confocal and electron microscopes. So there's a number. So we can have a microscope or magnifying glass to increase mag magnification, or we could be using like a $600,000 tool like I'm sitting in front of, or a $5 million tool that would be a CS corrected fully loaded microscope, which would be here. Apollo can take orders after the meeting. Now, why do we need microscopy? So roughly the resolution of the human eye is about a tenth of a millimeter. So if we magnify something a hundred times, we should be able to see about one micron in resolution, one millionth of a meter. And if you think about it, a hair, like my hair is kind of thin, but it's uh, about 50 microns. I measured it in the microscope once. So at hundred X, we can see about one micron. At about 10,000 X, 0.01 microns, we're at 10 nanometers. At 1 million times magnification, we can see one angstrom. So now if we have magnification, magnification is meaningless without the resolution, right? We can always mag things up, but if we can't see that two things are separate, then it's meaningless to have just magnification. <clears throat> and so in microscopy, um, we look at where the naked eye, and like I said in the last slide, about 0.1 millimeter our eyes start to really kind of not resolve things very well. And as we get older, that gets worse, unfortunately. Now, light microscopy overlaps with electron microscopy and resolves, yeah, from the few millimeter range down to, um, you know, we can visualize bacteria. Now, the electron microscope, we head back into uh, viruses and ribosomes. Below 100 nanometers is what really is referred to as nanotechnology in the classical sense. And to get atomic resolution of one angstrom, we really need an electron microscope. Now, imaging one angstrom is the equivalent of being able to look at a dime on the moon or a peso on the moon while standing in at Earth. I mean, that's how much we're magnifying the resolution that we're seeing. <clears throat> so what is a TEM? The TEM basically is a high voltage electron microscope that puts a beam through a thin sample, beam of electrons through a thin sample. We work at 100 to 400 kV. There are 3 million volt microscopes. There's only one in the world. Um, these big microscopes are just so expensive and they're very laborious to build. We look at transmitted and diffracted electrons that are recombined in the objective focal plane. And then there's a number of intermediate lenses and projector lenses that help us with the diffraction pattern. And, magnify things. And then we lift the screen because there's a camera down below. 
And this here is what an objective lens pull piece looks like. That's actually with the covers off. <clears throat> so like I said, things go through a very thin sample. We get a two-dimensional projection. So that as the beam comes down, the electrons stop or they don't, and we get a projection on the viewing screen. Now, actually, we can go from 10x to about 150 million x. <clears throat> Images are not captured on film anymore, thank God, um, which was nice when you had time, but they're done with digital cameras <clears throat> and detectors now. And for spectroscopy, we can get chemical information. So we'll be doing EDS is the most common um, analytical spectroscopy thing that's done. And then eels beyond that. And then eels, if you have a full system, can do energy filtered TM. And there's some benefits to that. And I'll show you some of the um, some data from that. So when we look at a transmission electron microscope, we can think of it kind of like a slide projector, right? So we basically have in the TM, we have an electron source, our beam, a lens to control the illumination, our thin sample which is actually immersed in the objective lens and an aperture and then the fluorescent screen. <clears throat> and now one thing to think about, and this is data a friend of mine took uh, a long time ago, <clears throat> is that as we're looking at stuff, remember it's a projection. So everything we're seeing <clears throat> is basically everything through the thickness of our sample. So we actually are looking through a stack of whatever's in our sample. Now this is a, um, uh, a particle, a silica particle with two gold cores. So we can see in A, B, and C, we have distinct gold particles. But when we get to D, we're not sure if they're touching. E, we're not sure what's going on. F, we only see one particle. And so in a TEM, we have, you know, we kind of have to really think about what we're looking at because our viewing angle does influence things, our interpretation. <laughs> so in life sciences, um, TEMs used, for biology, structural biology, molecular biology, histology, and really the biggest is pathology. And you look at like one of our customers, Mayo Clinic, pathology lab, very large volume in 120 kV TEM. Many hospitals will have an electron microscope to do kidney biopsies and look at you know autoimmune diseases. The Mayo Clinic actually has three of the microscopes that I'm sitting at that just run samples all day and they do six or 8,000 kidney biopsies. And they're a core lab that has a lot of stuff. They can do 3D, they do flow cytochemistry, cell sorting. <clears throat> and so it's, uh, that's really where a lot of the biological market is at. In material science, we, we can investigate metals, do research with ceramics, biomaterials, thin films, interfaces, failure analysis of not only semiconductors, but parts from other in industries, nanotechnology, catalysts, and semiconductors. Now, semiconductors, for years, the sheer volume of that was per, of instruments purchased by the semiconductor industry was massive. And so a lot of the design over a few decades was really geared up for semiconductor companies. They drove a lot of development. So now a lot of the manufacturing in the US in North America moved over to Taiwan and uh, China, Korea. And so TSMC is actually building a new factory in Arizona. That factory is going to be $3.5 billion just to build the factory. The total investment for over eight years will be $12 billion for this factory. So it's very expensive for them to make computer chips, right? They'll be doing 20,300 millimeter wafers per month using a certain geometry, and then we can look at, this is what a computer chip factory has, and they have loads of FIBs, SEMs, and um, TMs. <clears throat> Metrology and measuring stuff is 70% of the space that's used for manufacturing. <clears throat> now you look at semiconductor, 635 megabytes of RAM in 1982 cost 7,000. Today, 128 gigabytes is less than $10. If we tried to buy 128 gigabytes in 1982, it would be $1.4 million. And that's NAND. That's what we're look, used to doing for cell phones, for small mobile devices. Without that, we would not have really mobile phones. Um, 99, almost 100% of chips that are made are memory. The rest is logic. So it's huge volume. <clears throat> so now if we look at the history, I've kind of just want to focus on the key things. In 1931, Max Knoll and Ernst Ruska built the first transmission microscope. 
it wasn't until 1940 that RCA built the first commercial TM and that resolution was 2.4 nanometers. Now my company JOL started manufacturing um, the JM1 in 1949. And then in 1986, Ernst Rusko was awarded the Nobel Prize in Physics for the design of the first electron microscope. And in 2003, the electron microscope broke the one angstrom barrier. And it's weird, you see these periods in history where things accelerated really rapidly. The last 10 years, there's a lot going on, and I'll show you kind of what's happening. Now, you can look at this first TEM design. It looks like it was just drawn up on a piece of paper. It's 1931. This was actually the second TEM that Ruska made. The Joule first microscope happens to be, there's one of these sitting in our demo lab in Japan and it's got a wood table and there's a lot of, some used to have ashtrays I heard, but very, um, a lot of things. So the first SEM was in 1943 with Manfred von Ardeen. Theory of aberration correction, which we'll talk about a little bit, was proposed in 1936 and then 1945 by Otto Scherzer. And then we look at Ruska's development. So you see the first thing he built really was more of an optical bench electron microscope, followed by the one that you see I showed previously. And of course, he won the Nobel Prize. Um, I think the first prototype only magnified 400 times. So the first US TEMs that were built, and these are all custom things. So there's um, Washington State University built one, Newberry Packer um, at Washington University, WashU in St. Louis. And then we look at, uh, Ruska moved to Siemens um, after building things. And it's funny because this program here used to have one of these micros one of these microscopes actually. So I used one of these when I was in college. <laughs> and Siemens, of course, is in Germany, but it, the, um, here's the RCA model, Stanford. And the RCA model was kind of interesting because this early model was actually, the whole column was actually inside a vacuum instead of just the inside of the vacuum being called the whole microscope. And now, the 30s to 40s, we had a lot of early development. Manufacturing development between countries started happening more of the 40s to 50s. And so with Philips, which has now became FEI, then Thermo, and you can see some of the first EMs, right? These are actually TEMs. We can look at Japan. Japan was doing a, a higher resolution of the light microscope. That was the first big thing, right? And then we had all these other models and these are just early types, Hitachi's prototypes. Actually, this program had one of these too, a later model. Sweden was also in the um, development of TEM. The UK, we've got France. So everybody was getting in on this in the 40s and 50s. So what is the current status of this technology? We have cl very clean high vacuums now. <clears throat> we have ultra high vacuum, UHV. We have extreme electronic stability, machining accuracy better than a micron, <clears throat> unsurpassed mechanical stability, which allows us to see sub angstrom features. <clears throat> so TEM has been and will remain the highest lateral spatial resolution spectroscopy device in the world currently resolving sub angstrom features and spectroscopy on single atoms. We can do analytical probe sizes of, of an angst, of sub angstrom to a few angstroms. TM resolutions below 0.6 angstroms. Holographic reconstruction is better than angstrom. We have cold FE guns, shot key guns, high energy resolution eels, excellent EDS resolution with extremely large solid angles. Digital cameras are phenomenal now and computer control. So really what is TEM? So here's what a TEM looks like with all the covers off. So this is during installation. You can see basically a lot of wiring going on, um, kind of messy. Here's what it looks like with the covers on it. Same TEM, same room. And, and this is what the newer model of it looks like. And we'll go into reasons why we started adding covers and things. And this is what that same type of model will look like in the higher voltage version. And this cover basically is good for maintenance people and it protects against thermal variations and acoustic. Now, if we drop down below the microscope, it's a big open area. And now for STEM, digital imaging, energy filtering, that's where all your detectors are. We do have things up in the higher in the column, but we have a lot of things happening below the, um, at the lower part of the microscope. So we've got a beam stop, bright field apertures, uh, bright field annular bright field detectors, another dark field detector, CCD camera, we have an imaging filter, another detector here. So 
There's a lot of things that we can attach to these microscopes. <clears throat> and really, we attach it because we're looking at basically, we can look at the secondary single that's generated by the primary beam. We can look at x-rays, eels, bright field image, dark field image. And so these will be the things we are kind of concerned about and what we want to actually um, utilize. So in microscopes, we look at, as we increase voltage, we get higher resolution, right? So we want to be probably at the highest voltage, we have the highest resolution, higher penetrating power, there's less thermal damage because the electrons are very energetic and traveling through the sample very fast. There's less interaction, but we get more knock-on damage. We can have more uh, radiation damage from the sample. Thermal damage, now as we lower the KV, when the electron hits the sample, it gives away part of its energy. And so, and part of that energy is translated uh, to heat. Samples such as polymers, catalysts like zolites are easily damaged by heat. The higher the voltage, less heat damage for those samples. You have all these trade-offs. <clears throat> so knock-on damage, we have an electron comes, electron comes down and there's a possibility of a collision with an atom which will then displace it. So silicon has the threshold of where electrons will displace an atom of silicon at about a 160 kV. Now we look at a single wall carbon nanotube, 80 kV after two hours, yeah, we still see the structure of the tube. Now at 100 kV, initial image looks fine, resolution's good, but after an hour and a half or so, the tube's breaking down. At 200 kV, we get a great shot of the tube at first, but after only 26 minutes, the crystalline structure is amorphous and it's broken down. Same thing for silicon. We could look at these dislocation loops forming after you know just a few minutes at 300 kV. Another thing we think about is, and this is usually we talk to customers about the rooms because vibration is a big thing. This microscope here runs great at 300,000 X, but right next to me outside is a diesel um, the training program for big diesel trucks. And every once in a while they run these really loud engines. It affects the microscope. Electrical disturbances, being elevators being close by, magnetic fields, we, we can put in cancellation systems Airflow, you never want an air conditioner pointed at the microscope with airflow going on it. And you'll see in some labs, they hang toilet paper from the microscope to see kind of what's happening with the air moving in the room and pressure fluctuations. Now, let's see how that does. So there was at Cornell or actually at Bell Labs, uh, we installed it a long time ago, a field emission 200 kVTM. After installation, eh, there was some issues with the room, well, with microscope actually. And once that was resolved after six months, the room had issues, right? But there were improvements. The microscope caused this. The improvements to the environment really pushed it to the next level. And you can see here, it's so funny. It's so sensitive in that room that um, the spectrometer on the microscope can tell when trucks are moving up to the loading dock. So it's kind of your eels, expensive eels detector is a, trunk, a truck detector. One of the things we dealt with these acoustical and pressure changes and things is we added a cover to the actual stage. Um, and that's still there, even with these large um, boxes that actually go around the microscope now. Um, and you see here now, so <clears throat> the cover will kind of minimize acoustic noise from humans. My voice is deep. I can't talk when I'm doing high resolution imaging. Women have a higher frequency voice. Usually they can talk, it's okay, sorry guys. Electrical disturbances, magnetic fields, airflow, thermal fluctuations could be human. I could put my hand on the column. I'm pretty hot most of the time. Pressure fluctuations from doors opening. I asked um, Dave uh, Mueller who had that the data showing <clears throat> the improvements of the image. And you can see that when a door was opened, the image would shift three lattice spacings. And I asked him, I said, oh, is that the lab door? And he goes, no, it's any door in the building because these buildings are alive too, right? So what do we do? We remove the operator. So a lot of microscopy is done remotely. <laughs> now, single till holders, we have a lot of holders. I've got two, four holders here, actually five holders here in the room. But we got single till, double till, rotation, tomography, cooling, heating, straining, all kinds of stuff. So here's a view of a high tilt liquid nitrogen cryo holder. Now you can also use this for polymers or things that are heat sensitive. 
just to load it up, cool things down to the microscope. We also have very thin holders, or this is advanced tomography holder. So it actually, um, this one here will work for very high resolution um, microscopes where there's a very small gap and there's not a lot of room to move the stage around. Now, what I have loaded my um, nanoparticle sample on is I put in another tip into the holder and I'm using this high tilt retainer and I can swap out tips on the gel holder within a few minutes and have a, back, a sample back in the microscope. So here's a view of a high tilt liquid nitrogen cryo holder. Now you can also use this for polymers and things that are insensitive. Oh, Just somebody light it up, cool things down the microscope. Okay, so we also have very thin holders, or hello. this is a vast tomography holder. So actually, somebody needs uh, to view their volume work for very high resolution. Hello? Okay, there you go. So now you look at another holder. So I have this half grid holder that will hold just a half grid. And um sorry. Uh and, and so it'll hold the half grid. I'll be able to um tilt to very high tilts, like you go up to 80 degrees with this type of tip. And now we start to look at these in situ holders. So Protochips is one company that actually makes like heating and electrical biasing holders. They make liquid holders. So you look at a liquid cell and we'll see uh, if we can just get to the data here. And these chips are really um, pretty cool because there's a lot you can do. And you can see this breakout of the holder and kind of how we put things together. And so there's actually fluid in the holder so we can actually image, you know, things in a liquid environment. And there's, so here we have different controls and let's look at some of the data at the very end. And there we go. We can see these things happening to the sample in a liquid environment. We also have, we can test things heating wise and things. So another company is Hummingbird and they make a load of just great holders, right? So a lot of these companies kind of unique. Each It's like us manufacturers, everybody does things in certain areas well and better than others. So and if you look at like their electrochemistry holder, we can see here at in-situ TEM, electrochemical deposition and stripping of copper crystals and copper sulfate solution. The deposition and stripping behavior is, is cyclic and is an exact replication of what happens in a um, electrochemical cell. So we can watch dynamically what's happening, which is really great because, you know, before all this stuff, we had to take a picture then explain to somebody from a before and after what was happening, but now we watch it live. Now we can look at also the uh, quantum dots diffusing at high temperatures. And so we see these two dots they are kind of close, it's very romantic. And as we get around 650 degrees C, we start to see these two dots coalesce, diffuse into each other and forming one big particle. And I'm gonna speed up a lot of these videos because it's just, I don't, we don't need to watch the whole thing. Now, another thing is we have probe control on these holders. So we have very fine control to be able to move and push on things and do things like nano indentation. Um, we can check how sticky something is. We can push on it around. A lot of different things. Another company is Dense. And so they make a high temperature holder that's analytical up to 1,000 degrees um, C. And you can look at here, real-time imaging of catalytic activity. And what they've done with this um, holder is they've actually, <clears throat> um, the nickel is exposed to a certain pressure of uh, helium, um, H2O2 at 730C. And as they bled the gas in, they kind of reacted things. You can see what catalysts are reactive, right? So it gives you an idea what the dynamics are of the catalyst that you're working with it and gives you an idea of performance. Now, one of the interesting things is um, Joel recently um, purchased IDS and they're a wholly owned subsidiary of Joel. They make an actual laser that can point into the um, objective lens area of the pull piece where the stage is. And then they have three watt average output power, 570 nominee wavelength, but we can do other wavelengths. And they can pulse the laser onto the sample and it doesn't ablate the sample, 
but it does highly localized heating. So we could cycle a material and watch what happens, maybe have a phase change or, you know, cycle something many times to see any kind of breakdown. Very cool. Another thing to think about are TM substrates. This is a three millimeter grid. We typically use 200 mesh. The substrates can be holes here, which are more for a semiconductor and for um, uh, cryo. Holy grids for putting samples on, different films. And then a grid storage box is where we store our TM grids. Now, just a little bit about sample prep. I look at a lot of samples and I sometimes I prefer to make it myself because I just I just I kind of know what I'm going to be getting into when I prepare my own samples. So if you're working with nanoparticles, you basically can look at these substrate um, grid uh, charts from Ted Pella and it'll tell you based on your application what uh, film may be good for you. So um, as we go to from 200 mesh means there's 200 squares in that grid. 300 mesh means there's 300 squares. 400 mesh means there's 400 squares. As we go to 400 mesh, very high stability, but we can't tilt very high because the grid actually, we'll see the sides of the grid. Um, so basically you get a little glass vial, you throw a little bit of your powder into it, you fill it full of isopropyl alcohol and um, use an ultrasonic bath to actually um, disperse the particles in the isopropyl alcohol. And then you just put a drop onto a grid, let it dry, maybe put it onto a hot plate that's warm to touch, let it outgas, and then you can go. The whole procedure for this takes maybe 15, 20 minutes to make samples. So I usually, if I'm running like 10 samples of powder, I'll make a sample, put it in the microscope. While I'm getting at the microscope, I'll make another sample. So I just kind of move things through real fast. And this is just the procedure for do this. If anybody wants some of these sample prep things, feel free to um, ask IMRS and I'll provide them. Another big popular thing is FIV, right? So at FIV, we can actually do a uh, mill a sample pretty quickly. And then we can bring in a probe and attach the probe. We do what's called lift out. And then we actually weld that to a grid and we thin it further. One of the issues of FIB is that if we're running at 30 kV, the ions are very large. They cause a lot of amorphous damage on each side of the sample that they're hitting. So we want to minimize that so we can actually use things. Um, Fischio and I did this paper, this uh, Cecile Barafaccio, that where um, we use their Pico and Nano mills to, first we looked at a FIB sample and you can see this upper image is very hazy. There's a lot of amorphous damage, but we still see the resolution, right? Down here after um, broad beam or focus beam ion milling, we are focused large beam ion milling. We actually can see a much clearer representation of the image, right? And so then we can actually, and it's kind of nice. Another thing to think about is if you have a sample that's been sitting in air um, that oxidizes, we can clean that up, right? And so you look at this image on the left, there's a lot of re-sputtering and the uh, material that's deposited onto the sample we clean that up. And so we don't see that in the next one. So these are nice things to have. Um, Fission makes conventional TM prep samples where we can basically jet polish samples, which is good for bulk materials, bulk metals, condensed ion beam, which is the tabletop um, milling systems, the Pico mill that I talked about. And I'm gonna actually go into the plasma cleaners um, separately. Conventional specimen preparation, we're looking at thin samples, usually metals, it's jet thinning. And then IMB, and here is again another example of how cleaning up that amorphous damage really gives you a good view of the sample itself. Now, if we don't have plasma cleaners, one thing we could do is what's called an electron shower. And what we do is we basically <clears throat> turn on the electron beam to a very high current density. And we basically let it sit on the sample for about 20 minutes. And that'll pin down the contamination and give us a window to actually analyze the sample. I only do that if I have to, and if, it's a, if I have a one of a kind sample. One of the things we think about is plasma cleaning, right? So when we plasma clean, I have a sample in the holder. This is what a common plasma cleaner looks like. I can actually put my holder in here and it moves into this plasma area. 
And this is what a cross section looks like of where the holder comes in and where the actual plasma is happening. So actually here, <laughs> and we can see after one minute of plasma cleaning, we can look at these little spots of analysis of hydrocarbons that have built up on the sample. We actually see over here that that's been reduced after just five minutes. Now, if we look at digital imaging, right? This is where things really start have changed over the years. Now, if you look at a camera like the one view, which a company Catan makes, it's a CMOS camera. It runs at 25 frames per second, but at 16 megapixel resolution, 4K by 4K. We can search, we can navigate, we can align the microscope. And what's nice is all these modern cameras are so fast that they can do drift correction. So if your sample's moving and you're a little bit unstable, it'll actually move it. But you can look at like some of these speeds here. We can bend this camera down up to 300 frames per second. And then there's even modes to exceed that. And here we can see with what a modern camera does with drift correction on and drift correction off. And so there were 25 frames taken. Uh, the images were cross-correlated between each frame and the drift was corrected in the final image. Another thing is that we have these higher resolution cameras, so we can take kind of a lower mag image, get a decent field of view, but we still retain that atomic structure information where we can see out to 2.3 angstroms on this outer ring out here. <clears throat> now, these cameras are very tough too. We used to be afraid of doing diffraction. Now we actually do diffraction, and I'll show you, I do diffraction on the camera that I have. And there we go. And that's aligning to a zone axis. Over here, we look at beam induced damage on a zolite sample. And so we can actually just look at this and try to figure out, we can even monitor the dose and tell exactly how many electrons roughly will, um, does this sample um, damage in. Now we can do also a tilt tomography. This is called fast tomography. There's plus minus 72 degrees. This is about a three minute acquisition time. We can do faster now, I think, but we can sit here and just continuously move the sample and collect things as a movie and then time section it to determine what tilt range we're doing. We can also, for in situ experiments, we can actually record things as a video and kind of look back at where did that reaction start. There's triggering options, look back, and we can record for 15 minutes. That's a lot of data though. And we can output in various formats. Now, the top of the line of Gatan is really the K3IS. Now, these cameras literally can be up to a million dollars or more. Um, this camera here is a direct electron camera from Gatan. It's um, um, got 24 megapixels. And it runs at 150 frames per second with full resolution. but 3,500 frames per second. So it's insanely fast. AMT is another company that makes digital imaging systems. Um, sometimes you have to choose where you're gonna put the camera. Biological it used to be on the side of the microscope, which is kind of above the viewing chamber. The bottom camera is actually a better camera position to put it because we don't see any distortion. These side cameras start to pick up such a big field of view that all manufacturers will see distortion at that side mount. We've, on most microscopes, the lowest mag has been made like 10X where we can get a big field of view on these bottom cameras so that we can use really the full flexibility of the magnification range with that bottom camera. And here's what AMT's cameras look like, up to 43 megapixels. We can see atomic resolution here of uh, chrysidolite. This is uh, asbestos at 100 kV, and then this is just carbon on gold image on a 120 kV. So two angstrom imaging. <clears throat> like I said, we can do a very high intensity uh, um, diffraction. And then we look at the interface and the interface for this company is very friendly, very simple to use. Now, another company is Direct Electron. They actually, um, make a lot of um, very high-end cameras. And you look at a normal CCD camera, you have a scintillator, fiber optic coupling, CCD sensor, then it's cool. The direct electron sensor basically doesn't have all that fiber optic, fiber optic coupling. So it's capable of single electron counting, counting mode is what they call it, you might hear. And so, um, 
But these things can run at extremely crazy um, speeds, right? So if we bend it way down, we can get up to 100,000 frames a second, which is a you know, small image, but depends what we're doing. That might be advantageous for a number of experiments. So now if we look at actual TEM design and what's happening, my company makes uh, about nine different microscopes, that are our standard product line. We've always got collaborations and all vendors do it with different companies making these prototype microscopes that eventually will kind of move into commercial production. So you can see these larger um, TMs in a box are the, the cryo models, the high-end material science ones, and then the little one that I'm on here. Mo all TMs basically are set up with the same type of system. Well, lens, we call lenses different things, but you know the, the physics are all the same really. So we have an electron gun, a condenser lens system, objective lens, intermediate lenses, projector lenses, possibly an in-column energy filter, and then a viewing chamber. And then down below is our detector area. If you look at the electron gun, we <clears throat> basically have the most important parts are, of course, the emitter. Then we have a um, two anodes. We have an extraction anode and an accelerating anode, and then the stages of the gun here. For 200 kV, often there are six stages, which you see right here. And then we have our own, um, the illumination system to control what's coming out of the gun. As far as electron sources, um, we see thermionic emitters like tungsten, lab six, and field emission. And here's a scanning microscope view of what each of those look like. You can see, the cold field emission is very fine point. This tapers down to less than five nanometers. So it's a very small source size, whereas you can see the shock key, which is thermally assisted field emission is actually um, much more blunt. <clears throat> now, as far as electron lenses, right? Here's just a crude view of what an electron lens is made up of. We have a current source, current control, and then a coil. Electrons will spiral in this uh, field and we can't use glass lenses to control this, so we use electromagnetic lenses. And here we see the beam path as it goes through a lens. And so we basically have the current out, current in, and we can see the object here with the image plane over here in B. And we can see this spinning, right? And I can even show you, I can take one of my lower lenses and change the current and you'll see that the actual things will spin. The most important lens in the microscope, objective lens. This determines resolution and a number of other things as far as like solid angle and everything. So we look at a typical objective lens, you'll hear this part is the yoke, the coil. It's called a pull piece. Our sample sits right here uh, inside of the objective lens. And when you look at a number of different objective lenses, like this is three different pull pieces we make for uh, a field emission microscope. The ultra high resolution has a very small gap, which means it has a very small spherical aberration coefficient. And you can see as we go to larger gap, that increases, but so does the, resol uh, the resolution decreases. And the as we go to the smaller gaps, our tilt decreases. So um, we look at the condenser lens system. The primary objective is to focus the beam onto the sample. So we and demagnify the electron source. We can converge illumination for point analysis for STEM or parallel imaging and TEM. The first condenser lens controls spot size and determines the spot size of the probe current. The second condenser lens is fine control the spot size and continuously varies the brightness and illumination. Condenser aperture selects the unaberrated portion of the beam. Now, one thing to think about is why does a field emission have so much current density at small spot sizes? Well, we have to demagnify that source. To demagnify that source, if it's five nanometers, it's only five times to delay it, to demagnify it to one nanometer, right? So we don't lose a lot of current density. <laughs> but if we have something like a shot key field emission, if we go from like 20, 25 nanometers, we have to demagnify the source four times what we did the cold field. So there's things about that. So if we look at the objective lens, it's often called the pull piece. This determines if the microscope is in imaging or diffraction mode. And this is where the sample is inserted. It's an immersion lens. 
And the objective aperture is what we use to create contrast. The projector lens system is really about magnification and also controlling diffraction, stigmating. We have a, a coil to stigmate the diffraction pattern and shift it around. <clears throat> and it helps choose the area that we'll be getting things at. Now the TM stage, another critical thing. We see the cover here on the stage pumping down. Now you look at it for the high end microscopes, you're doing such fine atomic resolution navigation <laughs> that we have to really look at things. So we have a mechanical stage that moves in about 0.2 nanometer steps, but we have a piezo actuator, which will then move in sub angstrom steps. And you can see the fine movement of this stage just moving around and having very precise control. <clears throat> Excuse me. Now, when in TEM mode, what is it? <clears throat> Excuse me. What is it we're looking at? What kind of data do we produce, right? So here's a lower mag. You see the micron bar of 50 nanometers of an MD and gallium nitrite quantum well. And we can see the quantum well here. We can zoom up on it in a high mag and look at it at atomic resolution. So we have lower mag. We get an idea of what's happening. I need that lower mags because if I show you just this high mag, it doesn't give you perspective of really what I'm looking at. So we have a really good range of that. There's high resolution of platinum cobalt nanoparticles. Um, very nice. This actually looks like a um, lab six. Um, platinum cobalt single atoms. And so we can see these single atoms here, just on the substrate. Um, graphene at 80 kV, where it's raw data and filtered, very beam sensitive. This is a 2D material. And now we look at, we can do bright field. You see a lot of dislocations in the material, but we can also then mask out and look at certain specific reflections and look at the dark field image. And so we can look at the phase of what's going on. And then um, another example of that. And then of course, in TEM, we can do besides bright field and um, diffraction, dark field, Lorenz, which is um, looking at magnetic domains. So this here is a uh, SMCO magnet. So it's basically a rare earth metal. Um, so there we go. Here's another example to say magnet. So, uh, and it's kind of interesting, actually, I've been learning guitar during the pandemic and Fender guitars actually uses this type of magnet in their Stratocaster. It's also used in high-end electric motors, slot car racing, turbo machinery, a lot of applications for this magnet, actually. And now we look at um, another ferromagnetic um, sample, cobalt, iron, uh, boron, boron, which is a ferromagnetic material. We look at the lower ends and you look at low mag, when microscopes are in low mag, the objective lens is off. So you, if you have a higher mag range you can go to, it's a, you can look at magnetic domains. And what uses this type of thing is Spintronics, very huge market, almost $22 billion. Now we just run through a little bit on alignment. And this is, I'm gonna go through fast because we can actually go over this live on the microscope, but we really align from the top down, right? So we're going to align the filament if we have to. There's a lot of things that are, I mean, for typical daily use, you don't have to be so critical. You, your things are very stable nowadays. We can recall files that actually um, will default all the settings of the microscope. So if you have a user that's not experienced and they get lost, you can come in and click one button and reload everything to the microscope before they started and have it aligned. So we align the gun, the condenser lenses, the condenser aperture, the condenser stigmators, and that's just going down the column. To do filament alignment, we remove a sample, so we don't want anything in the way of just looking at the, the, the gun, the beam. We remove all apertures, set the mag to low mag, large spot size. We bring the brightness to crossover. We desaturate the filament, and then we can tilt the gun to actually bring the filament really on axis. We reset the filament resaturate, and then set the bias to get our right emission current. Then we go to the lining of the condenser aperture. As you're aligning the aperture, and I'll show you this on the camera actually later, but we don't want the illumination to be swinging. We want it to be converging from large to a spot, just up and down on itself, not swinging, right? <clears throat> now, condenser lens stigmation, this is something, if it's not stigmated, we're not going to get a spot. We're going to get an oblong shape. And that's not an alignment you really have to do on modern tools. Um, 
Eucentric height adjustment, very important. Whenever you start in a microscope, you put in a sample, you reset your objective lens, everybody's got it, and you adjust your sample height to bring it to the right focal plane, and that's how we do that. <clears throat> now, the next thing we wanna do is voltage centering, right? We don't want the image moving as we look at the voltage center and we wobble the high tension. So we minimize that movement by tilting the beam using um, beam tilt deflectors. Objective aperture center, we can do visually, we can do it diffraction. There's a number of ways of doing this and I'll show you that live. And you can see here in diffraction, this is what an uncentered aperture looks like. We're cropping the main beam. Whereas to the right, that's what it looks like centered. So there's a couple of ways of doing it. Everybody does a little bit different sometimes. <clears throat> now, objective lens stigmation, right? That's something that um, I'll check. I'll show you that as well, too. I tend to use an FFT of the image that I'm looking at at a higher mag. And I can kind of see, I mean, people used to do it this way. They would try to make this ring uh, one um, even, right? But you can look at a high a film in high mag that's amorphous, you can see here's astigmatism, it's directional, it's got all the shift in one direction. Here, everything's fine, much better. I prefer to use an FFT. So I can look at the image, I can look at this FFT, and if it's not round, it's astigmatic. And this is what most uh, automated software uses to actually adjust uh, astigmation. Another thing is there's a lot more automation. You can see the FFT of the image here, we have an option on one of our microscopes that actually does um, coma-free alignment, which is for really for a high-res, good quality imaging. And you can see here, as it tilts around and does this tableau, it's going to look at the beam tilt and try to, and, and not try, it's actually going to correct things. Now, this, this procedure actually takes only about 30 seconds, very quick. And then you end up with the before tableau, the FFT looks elongated in one axis. And we can see here with a little bit of beam tilt, it actually is fine. And then we can go back to imaging and how everything's done for us. So diffraction, what are the things we do in diffraction? And this is a great slide because it shows a high resolution TEM bright field image. Now, it, if we put in an aperture here, we get a selected area pattern, and that's just typical routine TM diffraction. <clears throat> but now we go into a, what the 200 KVs have this, the 120 KVs don't, unfortunately. The fine probe control in the 200 KV does nano beam diffraction, and that's NBD and what you see here. So I can place a probe <clears throat> right here, and I get a crystalline pattern, and it shows me the crystalline orientation of that probe position. Over here, I'm in the amorphous area, I get nothing. Over here, we can see in this crystal, this is rotated 180 or 90 degrees to this one here. And we, again, can do just convergent beam diffraction. I'll show you this. And with all the diffraction software on the microscopes, we can actually make measurements. And so things are much easier and quicker nowadays to do a lot of this stuff. But what do you do? You got really cool. Now there's a company called Nanomagus that actually <clears throat> sells diffraction uh, specific packages that you can purchase. And you do what's called precession. And instead of getting this normal pattern, this actually processes the being around through larger angles. And we build up this large diffraction space image. And we get a really good representation crystalline crystallinity of, of crystal what's going on. And we can look at orientation and phase and strain. So very cool stuff. So there, we can look at orientation mapping in a copper film, strain in a semiconductor vise. Here's just another example of precession showing here. Not precess, and you can see we covered just more to more of this Fourier space. And here is no precession. It's a nice pattern, but we look at here where, and then experimental. Another example of using this application with nanowires uh, or an NMOS device. <clears throat> so the patterns are comparable to kinematical patterns. Oh God, let me, uh, I'm sorry, I have to do one thing. Uh,
Okay. Okay. So we have this NMOS device, uh, less sensitive sample thickness, um, automated analysis is possible. So if we look at, there's another thing called microelectron diffraction. You might hear this. It's where we actually look at a crystal sample within the um, uh, microscope and we tilt the crystal and we can actually take a diffraction pattern in each tilt. This is done fully automated. And then we use actually X-ray detector software that then um, compute what's happening with the 3D structure of that crystalline sample. So here's an example of um, um, histidine and semitidine. And so it's a very, this is kind of being rolled out. I mean, people are adding this option to their microscopes in the last year or so. And here's the software that you need. You need a crowd holder, you need a camera, and you need software to tilt the sample. And you need a very high precision stage that can move in very fine increments that are uh, very stable. Now, analysis in TEM, yeah, it's possible, but since we're not scanning, we don't get an image for mapping. It's just really point analysis. You can't use your objective aperture, so we have to use a different aperture to bring contrast in because if we use an objective aperture, it'll flood our EDS detector with molybdenum and we won't be able to analyze. <clears throat> Although it is nice in TM to be able to form a spot, there's EDX modes that go down to below a nanometer, and we can just probe around and find stuff. But really, STEM, right? So STEM probe forming, what is STEM? TEM is a parallel illumination STEM, like SEM is a converged beam, and we're dealing with the 2D projection of a crystal or a material that we're looking at. We can get chemical information from eels, uh, EDS, and information from single columns. And one of the things that's nice is we have a very clean surface, no amorphous damage, and our beam is smaller than our atom spacing. The beam will actually channel down those um, columns of atoms if they're, you're looking directly at them. And there was a paper by David Moeller, who's now at Cornell, years ago where he looked at atomic resolution of a 600 nanometer thick sample, which you would think would be impossible, but it had a very clean surface and the beam was small enough that it channeled down the atomic columns. So it was a really nice piece of data. So we look at TEM. Well, in STEM, we basically go to a converged probe mode. We have a stronger uh, first condenser lens, a smaller second condenser lens, lens and then we have scanning coils that will then raster the beam across the sample. What's special about STEM? Well, if you look at the resolution specs for the pull pieces, you could have a pull piece that's um, got 2.3 angstroms point to point in TEM. But in STEM, it'll be 1.3 angstroms. It's actually an angstrom better in resolution. And it's a much more easily interpretable image. Now we have typically two image modes in STEM. We have bright field and dark field imaging. Um, a bright field detector could be a de dedicated at a detector at the bottom of the sample, but being below the sample, <clears throat> or we can have an annular detector that we can actually shift the beam, this bright field uh, signal here over to the detector and actually get a bright field on that detector. And here's what a dark field and a bright field image look like. So we're looking at silicon dumbbells. This is silicon 110. Um, we're looking at 1.36 angstrom resolution where we split these dumbbells. <clears throat> but one of the nice things about STEM too is we get away from that diffraction contrast, which is confusing. I mean, and diffraction contrast can be used for a number of things, but it is confusing for cert interpreting certain types of samples. Dark field STEM, we, we just do Z contrast. So we look at the Ronke gram, right? And it's a shadow image of the probe. And so we're observing this image at, of a, this is an amorphous area, it's what we align to, at really high mag. And you can see here, this is what that Ronke gram looks like when we, after we've corrected things and we select our proper condenser aperture to select the unaberrated part of the beam. And what's nice about Z contrast, we don't get diffraction contrast, we get Z contrast. So we can see on the film here in the bright field image, kind of hard to see what's going on. We don't know what's white, what's black. We, in the Z contrast image, we have image signal that's proportional to Z. Higher atomic number, we get brighter images. 
thicker, thicker samples too. <clears throat> now, this is just quick to show you that as we increase our spot size, we start to ramp up our probe current. And that becomes very large when we get out to, this is only a 1.7 angstrom um, spot, but we're at about two nanoamps and there's things to even get beyond that, right? But what are the, there's problems sometimes because we'll start drilling samples. So if you look at uh, stem resolution, and early on, we came out with our first tool, which was called the Joel Arm. Um, they called it the Beluga because it kind of looked like a whale that is blue covers for all. But you can look at, we were down around 78 picometers, and that was what we guaranteed on that microscope. And now you look at the newer microscopes, and since then, we've got these much, things are more stable. We do, we've done a lot of different things. Um, 300 kV with a lighter gap, and then also in situ observation, these detectors. But you look at what resolution can we achieve optimally, right? It, this is an image of a 40.5 picometer uh, spacing. So uh, at the time, it was the highest resolution image in the world. I'm not too sure. There's always a little bit of a competition going on for that between vendors. <laughs> and so here's another example we can see actually even nitrogen in the ABF image, right? So we don't see it in the dark field image, but we see these gallium um, dumbbells, and then we see the nitride spacings in this ABF image, which is in STEM, it gives you more light element imaging capabilities. So another thing is all these modern instruments flip around in KV, right? Because things do damage, and we do want to image things down to as low as 30 KV, Here's that same sample with at 80 kV. We still resolve the dumbbells. Another one, 60 kV, 83 picometer resolution. You can look at 80 kV of graphene or single walled nanotubes. We can image single atoms. Um, you have right here single atoms of CCM. And we pick those out. There's a lot of things that we can do. And then these instruments tend to be kind of remoted. I mean, they're, 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 all this operation is actually in the room next door. And some people will buy these knob sets in this whole setup so they can run it from a different country. So what's the Ronke gram? This is really the, the crux of, of how you align your, um, your STEM imaging, right? We can actually go into a Ronke gram mode and we can defocus with the objective lens and we get a TEM type image that allows us to navigate around the sample. So we can move around. Now you look at a crystalline sample as we move closer to focus in the Ronke gram, the actual, um, we start to pick up the lattice. And so, Crystalline material is not the best for correcting uh, astigmatism. Some people can do it. Those are people that are really experienced. Now, if we want to correct astigmatism, right, we want this thing to be round. We want the Ronke gram to be round. So now at that point on the right, we're actually, um, we're round. We've corrected astigmatism. Oh, now we, it's astigmatic again. And now in STEM, it goes back to, um, Corrected. There we go. That's what we want to be. And then over here, let's see. Focusing the Rocky Gram. So as we focus up, we just find that amorphous area. We can focus in on an area. And so that's the Rocky Gram. And you know, it's it's pretty easy to teach somebody how to actually correct that. A lot of the modern high-end tools have automated routines for actually doing this for you. Now, we look at spherical aberration and in STEM, spherical aberration is our limiting, um, was our limiting thing before CS correctors. Now, light optics have the same aberration issues that any optics have except that we can actually put a corrective lens, glass lens, like what you wear glasses, right? For um, correcting these aberrations. 
And here's a good example. When they first sent the Hubble Space Telescope up into space, there was an issue with one of the mirrors. Um, I think it was one of the mirrors. They corrected the software and you can see by the correction in software to correct for that aberration really improved what this microscope could do. It was pretty, um, pretty dramatic actually. And the, and the pictures that come off this are, are just amazing. So we look at spherical aberration, coma, astigmatism, distortion, all these different things, these lens aberrations. So what do we do? And we have nomenclature too, right? We call things, this is what Joel calls our different aberrations, coma, threefold, spherical aberration, star. And then there's CIOS, which is really what we use for a lot of stuff. And then NION is another dedicated stem. So they have their own, it's kind of confusing. This is what a corrector, the old corrector software looks like, actually kind of, actually the new stuff first, so. And so you have actually all these dipoles, hexapoles, and you can control these through just some of the uh, starting a tableau or getting an image. And we can kind of see what's going on. And this is kind of the order of the aberrations that we correct up to fifth order. And you can see kind of what the aberration and how it changes as we change focus, right? These are focus maps that show what's happening with these, the Ronchi gram. And the Ronchi gram with the corrector now, it's not this round circle, it's this big six star thing, possibly 12 fold symmetry. Um, and we see as we change astigmatism, we go two fold astigmatism, focus map zero looks good, but you can see also how things stretch, right? Axial coma, three fold astigmatism, uh, C3 spherical elaboration. And you can see that like six star pattern that we get in the zero, right? We get these spikes. And now this is what your Ronchi gram looks like with a CS corrector. And now that's excellent actually. So it's been corrected now to fifth order, really cool. So what is, how does CS do this, right? You don't do this manually. You actually run a few iterations that you run a tableau and do this continuous focus. And the software gives you feedback and says, okay, with confidence, this is kind of where you're at. And you can see here the tableau that's run and basically uh, it'll output um, what's kind of, what aberrations are there, right? So we wanna, as we're doing this, wanna make sure we're not contaminating and it should look good. Um, <clears throat> the target for correction are uh, the main specifications. We try to get you know down into the nanometer level range for some of these um, aberrations. And sometimes when you tune one aberration, it may throw off the other. So there's a little bit of iteration going on. <clears throat> so at lower accelerators, uh, you have different issues, right? C to C becomes a problem actually. So higher order aberrations have larger effects. And so you can see here, now we go from uh, three millimeters on there to uh, a five of 0.1. And we can see how it makes a big difference. And we're looking at 40. Now you look at these newer correctors, right? And these newer correctors took into account the fact that if you change mag, you actually don't have this change in the Ronchi gram anymore. So, you actually go to 30 kV and we're still above 50 milliradians on the Ronchi gram. One of the big problems now we think with aberration corrected microscopes is we're going to have um, beam damage. And so things like silicon nitride, we're going to drill holes in. And so how do you do that? Well, we lower damage one by going to lower accelerating voltage. Oh, wait here. So what we do with typically once the system's installed, we have a little corrector training program. We come on site, we spend a week, we work with people, um, we work on the CS, uh, CS software, our softwares, a number of things I'll just show you. Now you look at correctors generally are very stable and this I'm sure is with most vendors. Um, probably a lab manager should tune things at the higher order level, maybe once a month or once every three months. And that takes maybe about an hour or less. Um, weekly check of gun alignment, minutes. <clears throat> now per sample, when you're working with a corrector, you really just deal with coma and stigmation. And we have software that actually corrects that now. 
<clears throat> so we have software that basically does an under uh, over focus pair and then it kind of knows really what it should, how it should adjust coma and things and it'll actually adjust this in seconds for you and you can see this here going from a bad um corrector setup to a pretty decent corrector setup and it only takes seconds now another thing we think okay so we do this on an amorphous area but we get up to high mag we're looking at atomic resolution and we're like <clears throat> you know how do we correct things because we don't we're not using the same thing it used to be that we had to use specific samples for certain things now we can get away with doing all these corrections with one sample usually and so we go up to atomic resolution and we have a module called ad hoc tuning and what this is going to do is it's going to actually <clears throat> vary the focus and it's going to look at the direction of how things change and then it's going to adjust the stigmators to actually fine tune it for a uh, stigmated, aberrated, corrected stem image at high resolution. Oh, geez. And there we go. We get to the very end. There's our image. So really nice. So here's resolution at 60 kV, more of these carbon nanotubes pictures. We've got 80 kV of graphene, 60 kV of graphene, 30 kV, 30 kV of a semiconductor sample was still at atomic resolution. Um, we're doing mapping and uh, eels and EDS at 30 kV. So now we go into STEM imaging, right? Now STEM imaging, we can look at, we can see in the bright field STEM image, we don't, it's hard to see where these little particles of single atoms are, but in the dark field image, Z contrast, we have a light carbon background with a heavy atom sitting on it. We can see those atoms. But now also like once this, these atoms on this film, you'll notice that they start to jump around under the um, beam. So you'll see like around here, you'll see a couple atoms pop up, move around, you see some out here. So things are pretty dynamic. And there's another little guy that moves around. This guy's little atoms are just jumping around, right? And that's only from just the interaction with the beam. Gold tends to do that. Um, we look also another one of the functions between besides bright field and dark field is annular bright field imaging. So um, the stem bright field image is really kind of a weaker version uh, of the TM image. And then the dark field image, of course, is the uh, Z-contrast image. But you'll hear annular bright field. And, and what that's doing is it actually has an annular bright field detector. And then we have an aperture that goes in and blocks that central portion of the disk. And we end up being able to visualize being more sensitive to light element imaging. So we see here a light element. So uh, alloy here. Okay, and I'm going to go through things kind of quick. So you see the lithium sites, the aluminum sites, and people have even visualized hydrogen. Pretty crazy. Mm. Okay, so another thing we can do is secondary imaging at 200 kV. Here we actually see the gold lattice. We also see where we can do dark field and secondary imaging at the same time. So we get a surface view and an internal view. Now we go back to our specimen beam interactions. We can look at EDX, right? So we're looking at this secondary event where and why do we do that we're in stem mode we have an image and we can map things out so in stem we're imaging but we're in analysis mode we can pause we can point the beam at something and go who are you and then we can look at something next to it and go who's your friend and so we can see in this map there's actually a break in the wiring here in the um that, uh, copper or I forget where that's at but <clears throat> so what's happening in EDS? I ran these Monte Carlo simulations. And so you look at the upper left, that's a bulk SiO2 film. And the bottom scale is in microns, right? So we're looking at like 
at 200 kV, we're looking at like, you know, 200 microns of how those electrons are interacting with the bulk sample. <laughs> now, I then changed to a thin film of 50 nanometers and did the simulation with silicon, uh, silicon dioxide film. And we can look, now the spread is in angstroms, right? So we're actually, most of the beam is really confined to this area. So, oh wait, not that. Uh -huh. so we look at EDX now, and this is kind of uh, one of the big things. It's very common, right? So we have our inner shell, our K shell, our L shell, our M shell. Typically what happens is an electron comes down, ejects an electron out of an orbital, and then a higher orbital electron will drop down to fill that state and give off an X-ray, and that's characteristic for every element. Here's what an example of what an X-ray spectrum looks like. Um, we have characteristic peaks like copper, that's usually the grid material, and then we have background radiation, but we subtract this out. Now, one thing to think about in EDX is if you're looking at something and you see a peak, that peak should be probably three times above the background, so if you have 100 counts in the background, you probably want at least 300 counts in your peak <clears throat> for it to be significant. But, you know, there's all these different things. I'm just trying to give a really you know, base thing of what's going on. So we look at now, all of our EDS detectors now are these SDD detectors, what are known as silicon drift detectors. And there's no need for liquid nitrogen, and these are very large. The largest one that Joel Current makes is 160 millimeters. And what do we think about when we're doing EDS? We think about our source. If we have a lab six, we're probably not going to be able to do spot analysis below 10 nanometers very easily. For an FE system, five angstroms is no problem. A proper accelerating voltage, the um, detector specimen geometry is really just what your microscope is set up for probe size. So if I, like when we're investigating a new sample that may be beam sensitive, I put a probe on something and I watch, is it damaging it? And if it's not, then I just, I'm, I'm good to go. Or I will lower the probe current. And so basically as the beam hits the sample, X-rays are scattered in every direction. So here we can see that detector looking into the pull piece, right? Now, since we're only off to the side, this window is collecting a very small amount of all those X-rays that are um, generated, right? So we need to improve kind of the sensitivity of the detectors. Now, solid angle is what is the collection efficiency of an EDS detector. So 20 years ago, we were at 0.1 steradium, 0.12 steradium on high-end systems. So what did we do? We actually then took the detector, moved it closer to our source, which is the sample, and that in increased the collection efficiency. <clears throat> so we shortened that distance. Um, Another thing to think about as we start to tilt the sample, we can tilt towards the detector. A lot of detectors are pre-tilted now, so you don't have to really do this. It does give you a few more counts, but one of the things also is when you tilt, the sample thickness actually increases a little bit. Um, for EDS performance, uh, we can add one detector, typically 1.2 steradians. It's pretty darn high considering that's an order of magnitude higher than 20 years ago, which was 0.12 steradians. And now we're hitting over 1.75 to two over two steradians for two detectors on the column. So we can do things much, much faster. So when you look at your EDS system, you wanna say, if I put my beam in a hole, how many counts do I get? I shouldn't get really any counts. So we do what's called a hole count. And so we wanna see if there's any uncollimated electrons, um, the optics are very good at modern instruments at minimizing these hole counts apertures. We tend to use a high top hat, um, like a carbon um, aperture or cover on pole pieces and things that are going to scatter and maybe get into our detector. <clears throat> and so here you can see just kind of all the different things. We have covers on these pull pieces, a collimator for the EDS detector. We can use a lower aperture to get contrast in the sample. We need it for TEM. And here's the effects with it. We have an X-ray aperture then we will hopefully very thick, it's about super thick actually. It's, <clears throat> but without a harder X-ray aperture, we pick up this copper here, right? We put in the X-ray aperture and our system peaks get reduced by a, a fair amount. But also as these collection efficiencies have increased, we've had to minimize and do countermeasures 
because we start to pick up just more signal. Now, one of the main samples for looking at things is called a nickel oxide sample. And what can we do with that nickel oxide sample? We can evaluate a number of things on the sample. Um, we can look at hole counts. We can look at film count ratios. We can look at detector resolution. So this is kind of a great standard to have around. It's about $335, it's a little pricey, but it's worth it to have one. So it's just a nickel oxide film. What are problems we might have at EDS? No counts. We have to say, are the detectors inserted? Because these detectors insert and retract. If your dead time's at 100%, you're not going to actually get any counts. Um, make sure your objective aperture is not inside the microscope. If nothing's working, just turn everything off and on. Contamination is a killer for STEM. If you can plasma clean a sample, use a beam shower to actually buy you a window to not deal with contamination and drift. But drift is becoming less and less of an issue because we have such high speed cameras and ways to mitigate that issue. Beam damage, another one. Um, if you stop the probe, you are gonna drill holes on certain material. <laughs> and you can see here, the probe current scaling up to almost three nanoamps in a corrected microscope down from you know 1.4 picoamps. And we look at the data that generates, right? So we can look at this core shell um, structure of palladium and platinum, and we can see this three atom layer, right? And we can actually map that out with an EDS detector. This was done um, in 30 minutes, but you, or this, this side was done in three minutes, but you look, um, we're only using 12 picoamps of beam current, which is pretty much almost nothing. And over here, 37 picoamps, we're using a larger map size. Um, another example of what we can do at atomic resolution. We can also do imaging and analysis, um, EDS maps here, and then just stem imaging with a multi-layer with the mapping of that layer, right? So we have a lot of flexibility. There's a lot of things that we can do. Now here's one of the highest spatial resolution maps ever, the 63 picometers uh, map of, um, is this gallium nitride? And that sounds me actually, sorry. Here's an example of mapping with only 30 picoamps at 160 kV. So we're just mapping this, these particles. And you look at these intensity profiles and that was a map of a six angstrom shell three atomic layers and then you can extract all these line scans out and really look at what's happening <clears throat> the newest thing that we have is actually the drift compensation in edx used to stop take an image then look at where you're at and kind of shift things around now we don't stop we actually drift drift we're, we're scanning so fast that we drift drift correct on the fly and so we can then map 1k by 1k no one would ever take a 1k by 1k map in, in years ago so this is just shows the capability of what you can do. Then you can extract out a lot of information. You have a lot of things to work with. Now, just a brief thing on energy filters. Um, <clears throat> in column energy filters, we make one. It actually goes into the um, lower part of the column. Simple to operate. There's no increase in camera magnification from the filter being way down below the microscope. <clears throat> and there's no sensitivity to stray magnetic fields. Um, the older eels, post column systems if you put a if you make us move a screwdriver around the viewing screen it would actually deflect the eel spectrum so you look here we have a conventional image and a zero loss image so an in column filter is going to give you a much better tem image as far as contrast the post column filter sits down below the column the gatan makes the continuum there are other things in development for uh, more selection of types of post column filters but you look at these things will start collecting things at greater than 8,000 spectra per second. Their tuning is all very fast, all automatic. I mean, it's a really great detector for learning a lot about your sample. Here's an example of what that detector looks like in cross section. The beam comes down, we have a prism, disperses the beam across uh, through this sector, and we get these energies and use a slit to select the energies that we want. And here's just another image of that showing what's happening. And then the eel, uh, eel spectrum 
being displayed onto the camera. They're now using these expensive direct electron cameras for high sensitivity and extreme high speeds. What's a NEOS system look like? We have our low loss, zero loss, our low loss region, our core level ionizations. So EELS is different than EDS. EDS is a secondary event. Electron hits an atom, it, or electron ejects another electron out of the orbital, another one falls down, and we get an X-ray. EELS is just the beam um, sample interaction as the beam travels through the sample. So we're looking at a primary event, it's highly localized, and we can look at specimen electronic structure and excitations. So the zero loss peak tells us about thickness. We have the plasmon peak, low loss, near edge fine structure, and these are all things. So the zero loss peak gives us specimen thickness, plasmon, valence, conduction, electron density. Low loss would be polarization and complex dielectrics function. Core loss edges are the elemental composition, and that's what we're mapping a lot. Near edge fine structure tells us about the band structure, the density of unoccupied states. And then we can look at the XLs, the atomic specific radial distribution. So there's all these really high end things that we can do with the field emission sample. And we can see here where those things are in that yield spectrometer. Now, when we go into spectrum, we're basically um, imaging and building up this data cube. So we have the stems rastering point to point across uh, the sample. We collect our dark field image, and then we actually um, build up this data cube where there's a spectrum at each pixel. And then we collect the dark field image so we can collect correct for drift. And so stem silicon spectrum imaging is parallel. Uh, uh, we're scanning with a probe versus energy filtered TEM where we're using parallel illumination to map out things. And stem is, I mean, um, EELS is excellent for light element sensitivity. And here's an example of a map that was done with uh, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, mapping out these areas. It looks like a device, um, but you can, you can even map out silicon and you can look at actually, you can fingerprint the spectra because silicon dioxide, the silicon has a different fingerprint than uh, silicon substrate, and which is different from silicon nitride. We can actually fingerprint those spectra and extract maps out showing us where those types of silicon are. Very powerful. So what's good about yields is spatial information acquired in addition to spectral information at high resolutions. And um, scanning the sample instead of doing spot analysis minimizes some damage. Well, we can, you know, this rear, the, 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 the downsides are acquisition times can be lengthy for a high number of pixels. Well, yeah, that's true, but now things are moving so fast, that's starting to not really be a problem. You have to have STEM and you're just limited to what the microscope can do. And here's what an energy filter TEM image looks like. You've got a pre-edge, um, two pre-edges, a post-edge, then they ratio those to come up with a elemental map. And then we can look at oxygen, red, green, it's nitrogen, and then blue is silicon. We can also filter and do energy filtered convergent beam diffraction because the intensity is too high for a normal camera. We remove some of the inelastic scattering and we get this filtered image and we get a much clearer image of the Kikuchi lines going through the sample. And now we look at stem yields. I'm just doing this real quick because we want to kind of wrap this up quick. Just examples of stem yields where we're doing spectrum imaging. We have spatial drift that we're correcting from. We're looking at fine structure. And this is where I said the silicon peak shapes are all different, right? So we have silicon oxide, silicon, silicon nitride. Now we get into some more of the higher end applications. <clears throat> SEMs have done array tomography where you actually have a system, you have something that's gonna just cut a bunch of sections for you, right? And then you actually go to the SEM and you put it in an automated system and you image each of those sections and you tend to build up a three, you build up a 3D model that we can then mine for data later. There we go. So we build these 3D volumes and then you can segment out these 3D volumes and measure things and get an idea of how things are spatially resolved. Now, an example of um, a full tomography data set, here's data that was collected by uh, Wachu's group when he was at Baylor, he's at Stanford now. And so you're seeing uh, a tomographic volume of a cryo sample 
and we're dissolving through it in the Z direction right now. This is a reconstructed volume. <clears throat> and then the next step, because we collected the data, we built a 3D volume. Now we're going to go in and we're going to do volume rendering. So we're going to look around and you can see here as we move around, we have these viral phages on the outside of this um, cyanobacteria. And now this is all the cool stuff. Um, and now we annotate that. So we can see the cell envelope, I think the carboxysomes, styloquoid membrane. Um, what else? Ribosomes, vesicles, and then the infecting phage and DNA. So then we strip that out. We can see kind of spatially, since we've segmented all these out, kind of what's going on. Now, stem tomography and materials. I took this data at half a million X a uh, long time ago on this computer chip. And we can see in the bright field stem image, there's a lot of diffraction contrast going on. We're off zone axis for most of the time. All of a sudden now we'll go on zone axis. And boom, there we are, and it's off it again. But when you look at the reconstructed volume, we can spin this around in any direction. We get away from the um, issue of uh, diffraction contrast. We can zoom up and kind of look around this and investigate in three dimensions, really kind of what's going on. And so um, if we're going to do STEM, we want to really possibly do dark field if there's a lot of diffraction contrast going on. And people tend to do um, STEM dark field tomography, right? So just a quick slide. Um, in cryo, another way of doing tomography, it's not really tilt tomography, but they're doing single particle and they're imaging you know, thousands of these particles, tens of thousands, and then they um, can actually take software to then match out these particles and reconstruct a 3D volume. Now, these guys are amazing because they're getting down to the, they're at the atomic resolution level of where you can just, it's unbelievable what they're doing right now. And this, these, this application was the first one to image the coronavirus. Now, as we're doing tomography, we think <clears throat> we wanna do higher voltage because as we tilt, our sample gets thicker. So we can go up to a million volts. So here's just an example. As we tilt, the sample goes from zero degree or 70 nanometers at 70 degrees, it's about three times that thick, right? So it's gonna blur, we're gonna have issues. Also, like I mentioned on TM substrates, as we tilt, if we have 400 or 300 mesh grids, these grid bars are going to come into the field of view and I can't see where I'm at. So as I go to higher tilts, I have to think about where my sample is on the grid. We can use a slot grid, which will then not have any grid bars and that eliminates that problem. But the film can become a little unstable. It's a little more uh, a hassle to deal with. Um, what I have loaded in the holder is a nanoparticle sample in this high tilt retainer to go to high tilts. And then you have a uh, the Fischione holder, which hold, has these little grids, but I take a normal grid and just cut it in pieces. Now, dual axis. This is something where we tilt in one direction, but then we rotate the sample 90 degrees, right? Because if I'm pointing at you, I don't know if you can see this here, if I'm pointing at you like this and I tilt this way, you're going to see my the end of my index finger as a point, but you'll see my pinky and thumb. So I need to rotate 90 degrees and now, my pinky and thumb, but you'll see the movement of my finger and we can more fill that volume for the 3D. The software that I have on this microscope is called Cyril EM. Um, everybody makes their own. Cyril EM is a very common software for single particle and tilt tomography. There's an online forum for this, which is discussing things daily. <clears throat> you know, approaches to automated tomography. We can track it every tilt, but it's just really, you know, as we because we have to tilt, focus, tilt, focus, tilt, focus, taking image and all this. And we can pre-calibrate the tilt areas, but yeah, that's not the best for high mag. The Cyril M that I'll be showing you maybe later, it does a robust prediction. It looks at where the sample is, and then it kind of tilts to the next area, but then guesses where it's going to go but it still relies upon tracking, then it guesses where it's gonna go. By the time it gets to the fifth tilt, it, it goes into this predictive mode and it becomes very fast. I've collected plus minus 60 degree tilt series 
121 images in like about 10 minutes. And so it's, it's insanely fast. So the programs for these things also autofocus. So we focus, tilt, and I'm gonna go a little bit over on my time, sorry. Um, for STEM, we actually just fit a thing, but here's an example of STEM tomography. We have silicon nitride, um, silicon nitride film. You move it around. Now here's a good example of a paper that we did for, um, I think it was Nature actually, or maybe it's no journal of chemistry. But you can see this is a palladium platinum coarse shell particle and their platinum is becoming very expensive. So they're trying to build up this palladium shell with just a coating of platinum on it. So you can look here, we actually did the tilt series and then we reconstructed the data and these look like little marshmallows. And this is done at 1 million X. Um, now, one of the things to think about is low dose. And this isn't just cryo, we have to think about dose. And so for TEM, it's really critical. It's like I mentioned, KV is one important aspect, but also dose. Why do we need low dose? Because you can see in this cold sample, it's ice, the ice just breaks down. Zolite breaks down. <clears throat> um, one of the things we have to think about though, is that as we work with our cameras, oh, the high dose on the side has a much cleaner signal to noise. This low dose, it's the same camera, just at a lower dose. So we have these newer cameras that take advantage of different doses. Now we think about chemistry and um, tomography, right? With two detectors and a hard solid angle, <clears throat> we can actually go in, um, have the sample focus. It's focusing on the semiconductor. And then it collects a map. And then it goes back, tilts the sample, focuses back in, shifts the sample back to the center of the tilt axis. <clears throat> it does a tilt and then hands off control back to the EDS detector, which then collects more data and it repeats. Now you think about it because we're mapping, this could take, our, my, our goal was to run this in under three hours. I typically collect data in two to three hours. But then we get all these output of maps and we can actually then process everything in batch processing. And then we end up with something like this. So this is a pixel size of 5.4 angstroms at 1 million X. And we can see clearly what's going on with uh, the relationship and the wiring within the device. Paint. Um, now this is kind of cool. So as we go here, we actually can take this volume. It's been, um, we can then take it out, show tilt samples from that. There's all these different things that we can do visualizing these samples. And I'm gonna skip this because I don't have time. So compressive sensing is something that um, uh, is interesting. Oh, yeah, okay, here. So now, Visualizing, volume rendering is the last part of, I mean, uh, segmentation is really the last part of what we're doing with all these 3D tilt series. So if you look, we can actually come in and once we have that volume, we can actually pull something out of the volume. <laughs> and look around and then we can put it back into the volume. And I'll try to get this 10 more minutes, 10 more minutes. Sorry, this is taking longer than I thought. So then we come in, we can view things, we can color things by size in the volume because we know kind of what we're looking at and get feedback and output. Um, so then we can put output useful information of counts and particle size and things. And then here's also that array tomography through an, an SEM where we can actually just like slice and view in an FIB, we can actually dissolve, uh, cut through a sample, cut an image, cut an image. So certain scanning microscopes actually have a microtome built onto the uh, object, onto the stage, and it'll cut image, cut image. And just another example of how we actually go through these data points. So let's just do a little quick thing on pixelated detectors. I'm getting near the end, so thanks for your patience. Conventional stem detector, we're scanning the sample. We have a scintillator, a light guide, a photomultiplier, and the seagull's output. 
It's a 2D data set. A pixelated detector is a direct electron detector. And so it runs at very high speeds, very high sensitivity. And we basically rash the probe. We sync the probe to the pixels. On the, before we start the scan, we sync the probe to the pixels. So we know exactly where we're um, scanning. We sell a product called 4D Canvas. Um, this is what it looks like. The software GUI uh, for collecting data, right? So we can actually collect through our GUI, we open it up. And then we are actually collecting a convergent beam pattern at each pixel, which has all the information of the sample. So, but we're running at about seven and a half thousand frames per second. And here's the data that you can produce that type of detector. Now we have, we do all this post-processing actually. So you look at it a thousand frames per second, it took us 260 seconds to capture this, but then we can say, show us this part, these reflections, and we'll actually look at that orientation and we'll get an image of, of, uh, of what phase direction those are. Same thing with nanotubes. We can correct the uh, focus, there's issues there. You just select an integrated area and you can just extract these images afterwards. So there's a lot of things that can be done. You can synthesize annular bright field images. You can synthesize um, enhanced annular bright field, which is a newer version of the annular bright field. And I actually have this software on my laptop, but I'm doing this presentation on the lab computer. We can post correct aberrations too. So this is all really cool stuff. It's just gonna get better and faster and it is fast. So you look at here an example of imaging something very beam sensitive. Aquamarine is actually this, this um, uh, diamond-like material that's not diamond, but it's a um, jewel that mariners used to give each other for luck. It's super beam sensitive. So you can see to image it, it breaks down really quickly, but we're using a probe current of about a picoamp and we still get an image here. And so we can work with very beam sensitive stuff. We can also with typography, look at center of mass, electrical field maps. And then again, that's 7.5 um, picoamps. This is less than, this is 0.4 picoamps, it's crazy. <clears throat> and what things can we get? We can get um, now segmented detectors, right? We have segmented detectors versus direct electron detectors. So we can get an ADF image, a bright field image, uh, ABF image. Uh, we have 40 cameras. These are all segmented detectors actually. But when we look at a segmented detector, and here's what we do is we actually go and mask out certain areas and it'll give us the different signals that we want. And there we go. So now you have a segmented annular detector. So we can look at bright field, annular dark field, annular bright field, and segmented, which is like a DCI, differential phase contrast, a very popular technique right now, which detects local electrical and magnetic fields, beam deflections. And here's an example of PN junction, gallium arsenide, where we can see the inner electrical field. Now, Here's a comparison of a pixelated detector, which is ours against our other detector. You notice our fastest speed is seven and a half thousand frames per second, but the the segmented detectors are just live, so they're running at a hundred thousand frames per second. So acquisition is three seconds or so. We can look at magnetic fields, real time analysis, which is not what we do with pixelated detectors. <clears throat> we can extract data points. It's better on the so the, the pixelated detectors are better, but if you want to look at something live these other detectors are, are actually, you can change things on the fly a lot different than how you would with a pixelated detector. <clears throat> so you see, they, they both do some similar things, just one's live faster, one's probably more sensitive. And then there's just a remote operation. Now we're getting close to the end. I'm, I'm almost, sorry I'm late, but the, um, so what we've done, a lot of people want to remote control stuff. Um, I actually can, from my house, I can dial into this microscope and I can remote control it from my, um, my office, which is my dining table. Um, and by, our UK division created this um, thing called Virtual Temcom that is free. We can actually, it's used for drill instruments, but it gives you access to all the functions that you need. 
So if we use the mouse or the mouse wheel, touch things, we can save and store things, but we can really run things remotely. And so it's really a duplication of the panels that I have here in front of me. Stage control, lens and deflectors. And so I'll also show you um, a panel thing that's on the microscope. I've only got a few slides left, so I'm sorry for being a little bit late. So um, JOL acquired IDES in 2020, and IDES is now a wholly owned subsidiary and a part of the Joel product line. They've got some revolutionizing, very cool things. So they sell a product called Relativity, and it's basically electrostatic subframing, and on a kilohertz scale with conventional cameras. So um, you basically have a rolling, continuous rolling shutter, readout with a rolling shutter. So we can kind of break things up and we can actually take a camera that, <clears throat> that we can take a, a normal camera and we can make it a high speed camera by doing a lot of this subframing. So, um, <clears throat> so with that subframing, so let's say we have a camera that does, 100, 60 frames per second, right? So if I look at that 60 frames per second, I can actually make that camera run at 15,000 frames per second using relativity. And so for, um, and there's no artifacting. And this is part of this is also is that we have an electrostatic dose modulator that I um, does, which actually <clears throat> does 50 nanosecond. Everybody else like five microseconds deflection on um, blanking your beam. This says 50 nanoseconds. <clears throat> now here's an example of using that relativity and luminary, which I talked about earlier, which was the, the laser that goes into the pull piece. So um, what we can do is you have 75 millisecond exposures at 100 frames <clears throat> and the pulse laser starts in five milliseconds, takes about 4.4 milliseconds to ramp up and stays on. And so we sit on this, we watch it live because we're capturing in such an insane frame rate. Very cool. And then, like I said, we having this electrostatic dose modulation is we have a huge magnitude change in how we can deflect things. And that's game changing for a lot of stuff. So for things like EDS, 4D STEM, laser timing control, and you can see here at a 90% dose rate, we pulse this illumination, then we switch to a 50%. And you can see what's happening. We're still getting um, atomic resolution, even at half the dose. And so the blaking speed is just, there's nothing in the world that can touch this right now. And here's just another example, but this time instead they go down to 10%. And if you actually change the brightness here, it shows you, you can still see the atoms in the center. And now, um, then this is electro um, EDM with synchrony, automated TM. We can do some of the things here. <clears throat> and when we're doing this, it's so high speed, but there is no blur. And this is a through focal series, which is automated, just going through the sample. And then lastly, you look at like ProChips. This is the holder company. They came out with something that last year, which was called Axon. And you add this to your microscope. Any of these and it's for these oh, instabilities. Maybe. Inserting a new sample holder into the column, select complex scientific and typically perform through an experiment to optimize image voltages stacks up quickly. So this can connect the increments. Let me just try to show you what this does. On the left side, the sample is drifting. Moving the position of your sample in any axis is no longer followed by any residual drift. The sample stays as stable as if you've never moved it in the first place. And switching between detector modes or accelerating voltages to better attack an application with the full arsenal of your system is now possible without that soul searching decision of whether or not you can afford the older system is no longer impacted by instability. There simply is no longer any instability. So now for your lab, if you had Axon, Now's the time to find out. And that is, I'm done. <laughs> oh, can you still hear me?
Thank you, Kevin. Yes. Is anybody you. there? Yes, we are all we are all here. Thank okay. you, sir. Uh, we, I, we received several questions. I I believe I was able to answer almost all of them. Okay. Uh, I was trying to answer right now one of the questions that mentioned. Uh, I think you showed the video where you manipulate uh, some particle, right? Um, well, where there was uh, the nano move, um, tip moving I, in? I, yes, I think that's the one. That was a, on a real-time team image, right? Yes, yes. Yeah. If it had to do with the holders, those are all live. Um, the cameras are so high speed that we're actually filming um, at a video rate. So we're spitting out live data right which is pretty much it's kind of interesting the, the, the camera is so fast for doing something like that that even though you may not see something happen you can change that camera speed and do things and watch something happen so exactly and then when you yeah the, the question mentioned about the 3d image if you say 3d image you are talking about tomography right yes and in case of tomography, that's a digital image yes. that you make the reconstruction, correct? What it is, is it's actually a stack of images. So we, 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 we take the image, we start it like, I, I like to do um, what's uh, bi-directional. So I start at zero, I take an image, I autofocus, take an image, then I tilt, autofocus, take an image, correct for any image shift. And I just do this and then I do it all the way for the other side. So you have this volume of images and then you back project what the back volume is. I mean, I think, you know, I, I, tried, to, I tried to cover just so much information and I, I, I just wanted to give everybody a, a nice view of kind of what really is happening with microscopes today. And what options, Excellent. what you can do. Yeah, I think uh, it's great. I hope uh, we answered the question to Ricardo Martinez. So Ricardo, if you have an additional comment or question about it, please let us know. Uh, I think uh, we are almost done with the question. So probably we can go to some break before okay. starting the uh, practice on That's the microphone. That's perfect. Right? So right now it's 10.07. I'll leave the, I'll be on this connection. I'm going to just step outside for about 10 minutes. So I've already got a sample in the microscope. Um, we'll start there. Uh, um, let's start at 10, uh, um, what, 12.20? Is that what it would be? Yeah, so 12, 13 minutes, 20, I think, will be good. Okay, cool. I'll see you in, I'll see you in a little bit. I'll, everything's going to be on. I'm just going to walk out and take a small break. Excellent, Kevin. We appreciate it. Yeah, thanks. I'll be right back. Thank you very much to everyone. As Kevin explained, uh, we are going to make a break until 10, 12, 20 central time in Mexico City. So in the next part of the uh, course, Kevin is going to check a uh, few samples on real time and make uh, some analysis using TM image, STEM image. Uh, I think you mentioned you will do some diffraction, right? Oh yeah, totally we'll do bright, bright field, dark field, measuring particles, um, looking on zone axis alignments, polycrystal diffraction, single crystal diffraction. Um, and I'll give you an, a view of the tomography and things like that. And so it'll, it'll be a, a pretty good um, example of what we can do on the 120 KV. Cause I, I, I looked at things last night. It's, it's a, they're nice samples. Excellent. Thank you, Kevin. Sure. So see you soon then. Yes. So thank you very Kevin. much to everyone. Please stay tuned. We will enjoy looking at several samples from Kevin. Uh, I, I think uh, our colleagues from the uh, Material Science Society may have some comments to do. Please go ahead. Thank you, Leopoldo. Thank you, sorry. Um, yeah, um, in the chat, you will shortly see a link that will guide you to a form that you will fill out 
if you want your certificate of assistance. Um, oh, that will be all for my part. And we will start with some announcements. Francisco? Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Nat. Uh, some announcement. Uh, we want to invite you to register for the Simvestab Zacatenco student chapter. Uh, you can visit our website and get exclusive benefits. Uh, we want to invite you to the talk uh, Nanotecnología Agricola y Ambiental on March uh, 24, presented by Dr. Fabian Luqueño, research at the Saltillo Simvestab unit. And we invite you to participate in the next symposium on materials on MyFi and six. You can find the complete information on our website and on following Monday. And there will be a scholarship to participate in the International Material Research Congress 2021. Francisco, yeah. we cannot see your screen. Uh, sorry. <laughs> if you can start uh, again, your announcements, it would be let nice. Let me make one announcement. Uh, in uh, order sorry. to continue the uh, practical operation of the instrument, you just stay in the same connection. You don't need to go to a different connection, just keep with the same connection you are now. Thank you, sorry. Okay, okay. And when, uh, we invite you to participate in the next uh, International Material Research Congress uh, 2021. Francisco. And finally, uh, we yeah. can we can see your um, pantalla. Um, <laughs> your screen. No, um, you can see your screen. Yeah, we were cool. still looking at the uh, uh, camera of the um, microscope. Microscope. Now we can see the uh, uh, Congress screen. Thank you. Yeah. Uh -huh. I can Please continue. Start. Uh, okay, uh, finally, uh, we want to invite you to visit uh, our website and participate in future activities on the chapter. Uh, if you have any question or comment, uh, you can contact us by, by email. Uh, one question, what's the meaning of hybrid meeting? Means that you have a virtual connection but also uh, you will have uh, people on the Congress. That is the meaning of a hybrid Congress. Uh, we have uh, problems with the, the video. Um, I think that the Congress that was shown on the screen, will, well, the question about that could be answered by Dr. Patricia, if this will be an event, an on-site event, or how is it the hybrid mode? Jael is making a question about, will be an on-site event? Uh, Jael, are you talking about the Congress or you are talking about the uh, practical part of this course? If you can. Write on the chat. This.
Aprovechando el silencio, si alguien tiene alguna pregunta sobre la primera parte teórica del curso de Kevin, eh, podríamos aprovechar y, y, y puede preguntarnos vía voz o, o vía chat, como se sientan más cómodos. Muchas gracias. Questions about the Cancun Congress will be answered at the end of the course. Eh, Mariela, están preguntando si el Congreso va a ser presencial o va a ser solamente virtual. Creo que, creo que es una combinación hasta ahora o... Sí, doctor, van a, van a, serán ambos. Será híbrido eh, para las personas que preguntaron. The, the Congress is a hybrid. Hybrid, hybrid Congress. Hybrid Congress. So, by presence and also you will set the uh, all lectures by Zoom, probably. Yes. Yes. Um, also, uh, if you participate in our chapter uh, Congress, you will, you could get a scholarship for the Cancun Congress only if you are a member of our chapter. So you could um, check all of the specifications of this Congress. Uh, by Monday. Can you hear me, Kevin? Yeah, yeah, I'm here. Uh, one question. Do you have uh, an image of the coronavirus? Uh, Not in that I piece. I tried to keep this all materials, actually, so. Um. OK, don't worry. Actually, I have one very interesting that shows an image from SEM, then TM. Let me see if I can. Show it. We are almost about time, right? Give me one minute. Plenty of time. Thank you, sir. Por ahí alguien preguntó que si el microscopio electrónico de transmisión permite ver el virus, en particular del coronavirus. Voy a tratar de mostrarles una imagen. Con mucho gusto. Okay. Uh, Kevin, can you see my oh, yeah. uh, Nima's from a power presentation? Yeah. Yeah. So this is very interesting uh, analysis by your instrument. The first image, first image belongs to uh, SEM, right? Of course, 
ACM unfortunately doesn't have enough resolution to see the virus. However, by TM, you can see the virus. And by cryo TM, you can make a reconstruction of the uh, protein, right? Yeah. The protein inside the virus. And we can also detect or find the structure of anti-coronavirus drug by NMR that you'll also manufacture. Thank you. Cool slide. So should I share my screen now? Yes, please. Okay. Uh, I, you have to turn yours off. Uh, okay, oh. so. <laughs> okay. Okay, everybody is ready. We will continue Kevin's course with some uh, analysis of samples on real time. Thank you, Kevin. Oh, you're welcome. So here's just some pictures pictures of uh, coronavirus uh, with TEM. So you can see the uh, viral envelope, spike proteins, the RNA inside, and the viral envelope, right? So a little bit different. See how these things look? I mean, and then when you look at like the really high res stuff, that's kind of, they're doing single particle um, type stuff on it. So we close that down and I will, uh, Share my screen, new share. Let's do a microscope. There we go. So can you guys see the microscope? Yes, thank you, Kevin. Okay, good. It's where it's hard to see sometimes what you're seeing. Um, okay, so um, everybody can see this okay? It's very good. Thank you, Kevin. Okay. So I'll just give you, let me do one thing real quick here. I mean, uh, stop that share. So like I said, I'm in the microscope room and here's the microscope. So the door back there has pumps and water chiller and things. Over here, we have our condenser aperture our TEM stage. I've got a double tilt holder here and it's got a large back. That's why it's uh, got a motor that tilts the sample in this direction because the stage only goes in this direction. And then there's a connector for the motor to give it power. And then we have our objective lens. I mean, our uh, diffraction aperture. And then over here, sorry, I'm trying to, our objective lens. We have a viewing chamber with binoculars. I don't use these anymore really. The left panel on our microscopes controls the uh, above the objective lens. Our left panel, our right panel here controls the lower part of the column with magnification, objective focus, uh, moving the beam. And then we have our trackball for moving the sample. And then we have our little PC right there with my drive and our camera is down below here. So. Just to give you an idea of kind of the hardware, I mean, um, so if I share my screen now. Okay. So I have a sample loaded here. This is um, that Magic Hell sample. So it's, this is literally the um, smallest ruler in the world. And it's recognized by the National Institutes of Standards and Technology in Washington or Maryland actually. And so if I go to low mag, here's what that sample looks like at 30, at 25 times, right? So this is an IM milled sample. It's basically two sections that are glued together. They dimple things and they mill it down and we get a very thin sample. And so as I go up, here's our sample, right? And so there's this hole in the center, you can see kind of, um, you can see these uh, bend contours. So as I drop down in mag, let's actually go over here. So you see these lines that are going through the sample. 
as I tilt, they move. And that could be strain something in the, in the device itself. Um, but you can see, so now as I move up, these are these lines here. These are alternating silicon, um, silicon germanium. So as I zoom up, I get a much more, and right now I'm at 8,000 X. Now I'm at 40 and I can, Focus on these lines a little bit better. There we go. And there we go. So these lines right here are actually somewhere, I think across from here to here is about 100 nanometers roughly, yeah. And then the individual lines themselves are about roughly 20, 22. And then the, um, so this is used for measuring, um, setting up calibration for your magnification actually. So here I'm at 80,000, cover the, And let's zoom up. Okay, so I see these lines here. Now, one of the things like on this type of sample that I have to kind of think about, and one of the and first thing is the digital camera, right? So I noticed that something's moving here on the camera. I don't like that. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna just do a quick background subtraction on the camera. I'm gonna take a picture of the camera background and we'll, and this is something that, you know, is, is a, it's a good thing to know as far as how often do you do that? Because people always ask that with these cameras is some people don't take backgrounds. And I'm like, well, if you are going to publish, you don't have something that's, you know, you want to have a good background because there's maybe defects or dust or anything. So you want to subtract that out of the background. So what I do is we can see this bright spot. So I'm going to just say, take a new background and it's going to ask me to get a certain amount of counts. And so I'll adjust my brightness. And that's good enough. I have 20,000 counts on average. So now it's going to take 16 images and then it's going to um, um, cross correlate everything and use that as a background so that I get a clear image. And you'll see all this stuff here will be gone. And it doesn't take that long for this to do this. So it's just a good thing to know. It's one of the first things I usually do if, I, if I'm using a microscope that isn't mine that I haven't used, which is kind of a lot. So now we can see the background is very flat. We don't have that bright spot anymore. So the next thing I want to do is I have to think, well, what side of the sample do I want to image on? Now I've had this sample for a long time. It's really, and it's an expensive sample. You can see I was over here before, <clears throat> over here. So if I kind of come up into the substrate, here we go. I'm gonna insert my aperture and I'm gonna get very small. This is my diffraction aperture. And I'm gonna go just basically into the silicon, right? And then I'll put in a beam stop so that there's a little, wire that actually will keep from flooding the CCD camera. And uh, switch to diffraction. Okay. So here's a diffraction pattern from the area that I selected. And so it's, uh, let's see what we're doing. Okay, there. So I can change camera length, zoom up, zoom in and out. Right, so I have this diffraction pattern here. <clears throat> now, I may not even need this, yeah. So what I wanna do is I wanna tilt this on zone axis, right? And this is what you would do for like a semiconductor sample. So if I tilt in this direction, I can see the diffraction pattern moving 
up and down. And actually I have to tell it that I'm using a double tilt holder. And now I can tilt in the other direction. And I'll go back a little bit more. It's pretty good there. I think I can go to a very fine 0.1 degree steps. And so I get somewhat of a nice diffraction pattern from that area. So if I go back to imaging and see where I'm at. So I'm in this area here. And as I tilt it around, the Z height changed. So I'm gonna adjust my Z height. And I'll zoom up now. There we go. So remember before we saw these lines as just these black ones, right? And now we can start to make out the separation in these 20, 20 nanometer sections. So here's 150,000 X. And now we can see these lines that are running through in this direction, right? And so we can make out some of the lines through here. Now, one thing I have to think about, I'm at 120 KV. So I need to be in a thin area. Where's the thin area closest to the edge? So it should be a little bit thinner here. Yeah, it's not such a good area. <clears throat> but then you can see also if I try to go, now it's bright field, right? So the areas that are darker, are thicker. I'm not getting as many electrons through. So if I look at this thinner area and then I try to do a diffraction on it. Hey, I do have diffraction. Okay. I was thinking I was expecting something amorphous. So I go, let's maybe this one over here. Oops. Here we go. Oh. Okay, a little. And I'm just orienting. Let me take a look at where I'm at. Okay, I'm still in this one area. But if you look, these thinner areas, and this is an old sample, these thinner areas actually happen to be pretty heavily amorphous. There we go. So pretty beaten up. And this sample has been sitting in my computer bag for 10 years. So we have that. So if I was gonna take an image of this, I could just say, okay, grab an image, don't change my database. There we go. So that's an image right here. And we can zoom up and we can see somewhat these alternating layers. I mean, this is a good sample for really 200 kV and for some minor 120 kV stuff. But then we can also see probably this area here might be amorphous. And so I come in look at my diffraction pattern with my diffraction aperture and it's amorphous. There's really not much crystalline in this one area right now. And, and, and the reason I know that is I don't see any reflections. I just see this gray, this kind of gradation of, of, of contrast, right? So there's very little crystalline material at this point, at this point in the sample. 
So now if I actually go back and <clears throat> maybe this section might be a little bit better, but then I wanna go in and look at the fraction pattern again to make sure that that's okay. So I go back. And one of the things I can try is instead of going and using my selected area mode, I'm gonna actually try using convergent beam. So I'll change my spot size to a smaller spot size. And then I'll go right here on the sample. Oops. And I'm just gonna, once I'm at crossover, I'm gonna go to the fraction. And here we get more of a um, convergent beam pattern. So if I take my stage, I can see that it's, I can see these Kikuchi lines coming around, right? And then I can actually, I'm tilting away, and I come back. And that's pretty close. It's hard to see because of some of this um, other. Um, it's pretty high intensity, right? Because I'm not crossover. So now if I zoom up on this area, maybe we can get something a little bit clearer. Um, Now I'm focusing and so this area is a little bit thinner. And focus in. Uh, be a lot easier if it was a field emission microscope. But um, but then again, we can always just come back. You know, go to a spot again. And here I can stigmate my spot, right? So I'm just going for a much more round spot. And we'll move this over to where we want to kind of image, which I'm hoping is around right here. And I'll check the orientation again. And we can see it's off, right? So I kind of bounce around a little bit because there we go. Okay. A little better. We can see the Kikuchi lines. Um, that's actually a much better image to deal with. And so let's spread that out. And I'll just zoom back up on this again. Center that. Okay. Oh, better. And so now, I'm closer to the zone axis, right? So I'm getting, I haven't focused yet, but I'm gonna get a little bit clearer image of those inner lines, I think. Yeah. And the reason is, because now I'm aligned on zone axis and this sample's made by both um, molecular beam epitaxy. So these layers are atomically flat. So if I'm tilted with respect to those layers, like a computer chip, I'm not gonna get a very good clear image of how things are going because the beam sample interaction is just gonna not give me a clear view of what I'm looking at. And, but just by changing a few things, we were able to actually get a little clear representation of these lines in here. So, and these lines are just a couple nanometers. Um, 
<clears throat> but you can see, so I'm looking here at mainly like single crystal type stuff. This is a single crystal silicon. <clears throat> and so I typically can get a nice convergent beam pattern or I can get a nice um, single crystal pattern, but I'm not gonna see polycrystalline um, information, which is more of a ring. <clears throat> now, if we look back at the, um, the convergent beam pattern, right? So I move this. There we go. Oh, I got too coarse. So now I'm going to move my convergent beam to the center of the screen. I'm going to put up a little reticle so I can see where that center is. Okay. So we have this area here, right? And this sample, if you look at lower mag, gets much thicker as it goes out into these bulk, more bulk areas. But sometimes the thickness actually does help um, in getting like convergent beam diffraction. So now I'm gonna come down and I'm gonna go back to crossover. <clears throat> and I will switch the fraction, but now I'm going to move the sample and go to a thicker area. So I'm starting to lose the diffraction pattern. But it's kind of interesting because what we do is we start to get, <clears throat> for convergent beam diffraction, we start to get more, um, more, um, <clears throat> more of this information in the center of the image and that was too much let's see if we can get so I'm changing the intensity on the camera because I want to get a clear picture of what's happening in the center so then I'm going to use my projector deflector coil and I'll put this in the center and I'm moving this below the sample so it's not affecting where the data is coming from <clears throat> and then what I'll do is um Maybe change camera length so we can get a little bit bigger image. And if I change focus, I'm actually changing my, my probe size. So I'll do a photo. I'll record what that image should look like. There we go. So now we have a fairly decent convergent beam pattern. It's got a lot of this Kikuchi lines. And convergent beam is interesting in the sense that it gives you some idea of the thickness of your sample. The thicker it is, the more information you get in the center. And so you have all these, uh, it, it's a, it's, there's a lot more information. It's a lot more um, complex, but um, you know, with software and everything, I just imagine a lot of these things and we're doing a lot of things at high speed and a lot of these other applications <clears throat> will start to be able, some things will bleed into all this development too. And they'll benefit from it. Um, so I go back to my image and now I want to see where we're at actually. And I'll take that to its default. Okay. So we moved pretty far away from the sample. So the area we were at was actually, I think we had a, right there was a little box where I'd kind of beaten this up before, yeah. And then we just zoom back up and then, um, and like I said, if we tilt around to higher angles, you'll see, oops. You see a lot going on with the, the crystalline structure actually these bend contours causing it to change. And you see a lot of diffraction contrast in Z contrast. We probably wouldn't really see this as heavy. And then you could look, I've got a piece of dirt that somehow landed on this and I'll have no way of getting it off because it's huge. <clears throat> but then again, we go back through this line and it goes to the edge of the sample. Come back to the center. And so it's a great sample just because it shows a lot of different stuff. Um, but I think I'm going to switch over to the nanoparticle sample. So 
unless anybody has any questions about this sample, I'll, I'll, I'll change samples. Okay. I think we can move to other sample, Kevin. Thank yeah. you. Okay. So, uh, Kevin. Yeah. There is an inter interesting question. Uh, it says, why when the sample is irradiated by X-ray, I already explained that it is not irradiated by X-ray, it's irradiated by electrons. Yeah. But why the sample looks illuminated in some parts? Can, can you explain uh, the, uh, the yeah, contrast that, on the that, TM image? Yeah, so let me, um, let me see if I can get, before I can try to take a picture of this before it disappears. Um, Okay. For some reason this does not like the Zoom connection. Okay. So if we look at the sample here, right, we have these, um, we have these light areas, right? We have some darker areas that'll go darker and darker. And that's just a function of the thickness of the sample. When it's thin or there's a whole electrons pass through and it's brighter. <laughs> when it's a high Z material or thicknesses are thicker, it scatters those electrons out to higher angles and they don't fall onto the CCD. So that area appears dark. So if you look at the left corner, that's that big chunk, it's adding dense uh, thickness to it. So it scatters electrons, we can't get through it because at a one point we're just not getting enough electrons through the sample. Same thing over here, we've got a different material. The bright field image, that's kind of confusing sometimes because the diffraction contrast is dark. <clears throat> and so if we have a high diffraction contrast, it's not a change in thickness, but it's deflecting those electrons away, right? It's kind of a similar thing. So let me pull this out real quick. Okay, let's, let's Thank you, Kevin. Another question is about if you can make a live Ronchigram. Um, no, I not on this tool because I don't have a stem. That's There's right. No stem. And then, so if you look here, I have one of these small little tips to go to high tilts. So I'll pull this holder out. Oops. Pull that one in. The the ronchigram uh, is uh, related to a stem image. So unfortunately, yeah. this microscope doesn't have the uh, stem uh, system. It's uh, right. only a TMO. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so it's, um, for one thing, it's uh, the Rocky Gram, you have to have a stem mode to look at it. I mean, you could look at a spot mode in TEM, but when you look at the 120 kV microscopes, they're not small probe microscopes. We can look at the Rocky Gram Probably not as good as a 200 kV instrument, but you can't see it. The, um, but you look at it, where do, when you go from 120 to 200 kV, where does it, what does the 200 kV tool do that is better than the 120 kV? <clears throat> Diffraction. <clears throat> the 200 kV can form a nanoprobe less than a nanometer, so you can do diffraction from a spot of roughly a nanometer. So if I had two crystals that were very small and I wanted to look at what their diffraction was, what their orientation was or with respect to each other or maybe at a grain boundary, I can probe it with a one nanometer probe. 120 kVs will not do that. <clears throat> if I wanna do analysis, I have to do it in STEM. Now this is another thing to think about. If I have a field emission, I get around a one nanometer spot. I have a lot of signal for EDX. If I have a lab six and I have a one nanometer probe, I have no signal for EDX. And that's just a function of the emitter. So, um, so I'll go to the high tilt holder. Thank you, Kevin. Yeah. yeah. Yes. I hope that answered the question. Yeah, um, I think so. Yeah. I mean, you think about it, it's like that slide I showed of a slide projector, right? We have an illumination source. We have a sample. 
everything goes through that and then it's over here, right? If I have my hand open, the electrons are gonna come through where it's open between my fingers, but they're gonna stop where my finger is. So where my finger is, is gonna be black. But the electrons that get through, it's gonna be bright. So it's uh, <clears throat> just a basic function of, of how it's either stopping the electrons. Now, what do we do if we have a thick sample? And I mean, I used to have data from a 3 million volt microscope in Osaka, Japan, where they looked at five micron thick samples, not 80 nanometers or 50 nanometers. And through that five micron sample, they could do tomography because it was a larger volume of sample, right? <clears throat> I mean, in tomography, people used to cut a sample like the SEMs and then image, cut a sample, image, cut a sample, image. Problem doing that is that every time you cut a section, <laughs> there's compression of your sample. And <clears throat> when you cut through these resins, you have a distortion on each side of the surface, right? So as I cut through each section, I've got to then match up those areas that are distorted so the resolution can suffer. <clears throat> if we use a thicker sample, we have a more of a volume and we can actually see clearer what's, um, we get more information. And so I think I should see image now. And I'm running a lab six in this tool. So there's a little bit of a warm up time. Tungsten is off and on. Tungsten tips are only like $15, $20. Lab six tips could be about over a thousand. So, but you're going to get long life. A lab six, you'll get 1,500 to 2,000 hours off. A tungsten, three to 500 hours, maybe. So, a lot of it just functions and depends on really what you're doing. In, in, in some of the biological labs, like pathology, where they just screen a lot of samples, they actually use lab six. And the reason is because um, they don't want any downtime. Now, one of the other holders that we can use to save time is, and I, I didn't use this, this showed up two days ago, is this here is a four sample holder. Wait, let's see, where's the camera? Oh, there it is. So this holder holds four samples. <clears throat> and then the back of it actually rotates and moves it in and out. So kind of cool. I used to have an eight sample holder actually. But then you think, you know, a lot of these holders are kind of thin. You get a four or eight sample and a bulky holder, you just have more issues probably with vibration and drift from a holder like that. <clears throat> okay, so. What we're imaging now is a, um, <clears throat> now you see these squares here. This is, I think, a 300 or 400 mesh grid. Whereas before we had much smaller grid lines, grid bars. <clears throat> so if I zoom in on this sample, it's got these quantum dots on here. And this is a sample that a company sent to me to give them feedback on how homogenous, how how are these particles? Are they all the same size? And they wanted to use this as a magnification calibration similar to what the last sample you looked at did. <clears throat> so these are 50 nanometer gold particles. So let's look, now cameras, we went through the whole thing of taking a background, right? This background looks good. We took it on the last sample of just an open area, right? You can't take an image of a background with anything in it because that becomes part of the background. So we did that already. So I aligned the tool kind of yesterday. I mean, it's not, let me see. So now if I am aligning my illumination, right? So let's say I come down here. My illumination basically comes straight in and out. Now, if I misalign my aperture, even though my illumination looks centered, oh, here, let me misalign it a lot. There we go. Okay, this will be really bad. See, the illumination swings. Now, that's not normal. So we actually go to crossover. We bring the illumination back to center. And then as I spread it out, I just spread it out to the edge of the screen. 
and I bring it back to center with my mechanical shifts on the aperture itself. And now this is something that, yeah, I mean, I, I know when I'm moving the illumination that if I see it swinging, I'll align it. It's not necessarily something I check every day unless I'm changing apertures. Um, if you have to, if you, and you think about it this way, if, if you're on a microscope and your microscope, the apertures are, you have to align constantly, you should call service because these things should not be drifting. So it's, um, so now I go back to brighter beam, which is too bright. Here we go. And so that's aligning my um, illumination system. That's my condenser aperture. So now I'm gonna look at my voltage center. So I've got a little button that's, uh, actually I actually have to put this at the right height so I can see that these samples, they move a little bit. So I'm gonna adjust the sample height to bring it to the correct spot. And you can see, see the diffraction like right here, these white dots, right? As I change, that's the crystal diffracting the beam. So I don't know if you guys can see that, but as I go under focus, see these white areas that just move? Let me uh, stop wobbling and you can see it. So you can see these kind of white spots that just come in and out, right? Those aren't real, that's just the beam um, diffracting the sample. So as I go here, and that's diffracting from the crystal of this gold material. So I'll just uh, make sure my height is correct again. Good. So I've lined my Z height now and that's fine. So now I'm gonna check my voltage center and I push this thing called an HT wobbler. It's wobbling the high tension of the microscope. And I'm gonna show you what happens when this is not aligned. So what I'll do is I'll, I'll throw it way off. And so this is a bad aligned voltage center. So what happens when my voltage center is not correct? At high mag, my coma is not good. I'm gonna actually have areas in, that are gonna be in focus here, but out of focus here. And like an SEM, if you don't have current centering properly set in an SEM, as I focus, the sample's gonna move, which is not what you want. Because then I have a, then I'm like, where's the center of focus? So I go back to my voltage center And I could bring it, let me see which way I went. Oh, of course, okay, you, there we go. So now it's moving vertically. So I'll go to the next knob and then it just kind of pulses on itself almost. There we go, pretty good. Um, I'm doing this at 20. I usually do this a little bit higher mag. So now, as I go up, and remember how much it shifted when we were moving, um, when we were focusing. Now, if I focus, it just stays in one spot almost and focuses in and out, right? It doesn't have that big shift. Okay, so I've got my voltage center set pretty well. I've got my sample height set pretty well. My Condenser aperture is aligned. So now I'm going to actually look at um, putting in a objective aperture. Now for a lot of materials, we really don't need this. It's more a lot of, a lot of biological stuff, but um, I'll come here. And if I put in a pretty small aperture, I can see the aperture as I move it around, right? So I can kind of say, okay, that's about the center of that as I go back up. But if I really want to check this aperture position, I'm going to use diffraction and I'm going to go um, here and I'll put in my little spot. Oh, wait. 
just cover that to protect the camera. <clears throat> Actually, I don't need that. Um, so what we see here, we see the edge of the aperture in diffraction. Now that's my objective aperture. This is the zero order beam and I'm picking, uh, I'm using that to align to, right? So now I'm off of the aperture. So I can see the shadow of the aperture. And for me, it's a quick and easy way to do it. If I really wanna make sure everything is, is well um, set up. And then I get out of diffraction, pull this aperture out and there we go. And now I'm using an objective aperture. So if I set this up here, what, so I'm flipping around a lot. So the, um, I just want to make sure that everything's good. So now I've got these samples here. My beam is a little bit bright, so I'll lower it back down. And then we'll go up to the edge of one of these particles. And here we can see the amorphous substrate. These particles are roughly 50 nanometers is what I measured yesterday. Oh, yeah, roughly 50 or so. And if I go a little over uh, here and move this to here. But yeah, these are roughly pretty homogeneous 50 nanometer particles. Um, So what could we do with nanoparticles on a 120 kV? One thing is we could look at, is it crystalline? Is it amorphous? Is it a single crystal? Is it like you look at some of these particles might be, have twinning in the center or something. Um, like right here, we have something going on here. The contrast is different, but now, to finish my final alignment for imaging, even though it's pretty good here, is I'm going to move over into the substrate because I want to look at an amorphous area, something like this. So I've got this random pattern. I'm going to take my objective stigmators. And there's always a warning that we're not using the right control. Um, so I'm going to take my stigmators, and this is a somewhat of a decent image at 120,000, right? We're looking at a carbon film, these, <clears throat> these, these particles of carbon are sub nanometer. They're in like the four or five angstrom range, probably. And you can see also like my voice now, 120, not so bad. Bah, bah. So I can knock on the column, right? So you can kind of see how things root pound on the table, right? That's vibration. But one of the things I want to check now, I'm looking at this very clean amorphous background, and I'm going to take my stigmators and I'm going to throw them way up. So now I have this image and it's smeared. And so let's go back to the particles and see what they look like. I can't get a very good focused image, right? The particles, I'm losing resolution because the stigmation is just not set properly. So I could manually kind of go, okay, what's going on? How do I find out what I'm doing? And I'm like, ah, I don't know what to do. Now, most microscopes have an alignment panel that you can then say, oh, reset my objective stigmators back to zero. We, I set this about three weeks ago and it really hasn't changed. But let's throw this, oh, let's, um, throw this off again. And this time I'm gonna um, throw my stigmators out. But what I'm gonna do is instead of using this reset button, I'm gonna look at an FFT of the image. So now that I have this FFT, you can see that this image here is just smeared in one axis, right? It's terrible. I want to make it circular around, kind of like the Ronke gram when he stigmated on that in STEM. So I can see him coming here. I'm going to try to change this one. I'm getting close to where it should be, but now it's showing me my focus is off. And how do I know that? The reason I know that 
is that um, as I go closer to focus, this, this FFT gets bigger. So now as I get closer to focus, I'm coming and let's do this a little bit better. Okay. So now as I get, now I'm in focus. And that's where things are kind of in phase and I'm not really getting a lot of contrast. I don't see the background anymore. So now I go over focus and the Rocky Graham, I mean the um, FFT actually cut, pops back in. And now I go far over focus and it becomes very small. Come back to in focus. And that's probably where I want to be set. And so that's what I'm going to um, just set my stigmators at. And I'll kind of straighten this out again. There we go. Good enough. So now when I go back over to the particles, and I'm focused, I'm focused right now to the background, of the, the substrate, right? The particles are actually sitting on the substrate. So I'm probably going to have to defocus a little bit just to get a clear image of the particles. So here's 300,000x. Uh, not too bad. <laughs> not bad. So if I zoom up on the particle here, yeah, it's still pretty good. So now I'm at half a million X. And I'm gonna go check out this, this again. Let me just find it, there we go. And I'll use this to focus on. Yeah, pretty good. Let me get a little bit. Oh, a little bit finer focus. Here we go. Okay, so now we're at 500,000 X. You can see my voice actually really affects the image now. Just normal talking. And so you can see that things kind of fade in and out. If I turn my head towards the stage, probably worse. But let's even see higher mag. Here's 600,000 X. Um, 800,000 X. And we're starting to lose some of the beam, right? The signal's not that great at this mag. I could slow the camera down. And so if I want to get more exposure on the camera for this search mode, or I can bin it way down, maybe that'll help. Makes it faster. But then I should be able to, there we go. So I can play around with these kind of camera settings to try to bring out more signal. And there we go. And so now I have more signal, but you notice the frame rate's really gone down. And this is a decently sensitive camera. It's a scientific CMOS. But I'll go back to my old default settings. Um, you can see only for the photo mode do I actually do drift or drift compensation. So we see here, let's try to go up to a, here's a million. And now 1.2 million, my voice, I can't really talk. So if you're ever in a room and taking data and there's people sitting in the back talking, it's usually a salesman in my case, <laughs> then um, you have to tell everybody to be quiet. And then we come back here and this is kind of cool with the sun. So now we're pretty well aligned. I think one thing I'm gonna do is I kind of set this high mag, um, stigmation setting. So this might be off a little bit, and I think it is a lot actually. So I'm going to go back and I'm just going to say, you know, I know my default to this is good. 
we can see this is a misaligned, bad stagnation. I'm going to neutralize that. And it just goes back to what it should be. So now on this sample, we're going to do a little bit, something different with the diffraction. So if I want to look at a polycrystalline pattern, I'll put in my diffraction aperture, right? And I'll put in kind of a big one. I'll, I'll get a lot of crystals in this. And I will oh, turn off that. And then I will switch to diffraction mode, pull that out. And you can see here that we're actually getting There we go. Now you're looking at more of a polycrystalline pattern. I'll move around and I'm just not even imaging, but we can see and I'll focus the diffraction pattern a little bit. Maybe put this out. There we go. That was better. So now if I take a picture of this, sec. I don't know why this oh, wait. Hmm. That's weird. Never okay. For some reason, it's just weird. I don't know if it's because we're on Zoom or something, but I can open this up and then I can actually look at this pattern here. If I wanted to, I could actually measure like diffraction and come in and do different measurements around here, showing the angle, the D spacings. And so I can really kind of use this to kind of measure the distances of things and very cool. Then I have actually this to move it out. We're looking at different angles, different D spacings, and that's fine. Now, um, the what we want to look at though is right now we're imaging all these particles, right? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to a smaller selected area aperture. One more, there we go. So now I've got this smaller aperture and I'm gonna come in and if I do diffraction, I'm still gonna get that polycrystalline image, right? Where, and what we're looking at is, you know, you have a single crystal and where everything's in the same direction. On a polycrystalline sample, you have the same, um, diffraction pattern, but it's rotated. And so you end up getting this circle as those crystals are rotated around each other. <laughs> and so what I want to do now is I want to say, okay, what if I only want to look at one particle? Well, maybe two. These ones are kind of... Ah, here we go. Two right here. Oh, one right there. Perfect. So I've got this one particle here. Let's see if we can get a diffraction pattern from this particle. Hmm, a little something, but it's hard to really tell. Um, okay, how about two particles? There we go. So this is a diffraction pattern from two 50 nanometer particles. We don't have a lot of the other reflections making up a polycrystalline uh, pattern. So now one of the things we can do, and I'm gonna do this without, uh, now we're looking at a bright field image. And that's just a standard TM image. Okay, and there we go. 
Now, let's say I want to look at like the dark field image of, of this. Now, typically we go into fraction, we would set up um, our aperture so that we would tilt whatever reflection we wanted into the aperture plane so that we could actually only use those electrons. The easy way to do this, where you kind of don't really know what's going on though, is to use your objective aperture. We can see my objective aperture is blocking my image, but it's selecting part of the diffraction pattern and the crystals that are oriented in that reflection that it's selecting, you get electrons come through and you see what's called a dark field image. Now, since we're screening out a lot of the electrons, we can see that the image is um, uh, kind of weak, a little bit noisy. So ways that we do deal with dark field is we usually collect for a longer time. And so this here, you can see there's still a little bit of noise and it does look like the coronavirus is weird. So if I go back to my camera now and I say, you know, I'm doing something pretty, uh, I want a preview. So I want to add, let's add more frames together. Let's give that a try. I'm going to apply that. I'm going to try to take an image. So now it's going to take maybe eight seconds to get the data, but it's going to be drift corrected. Things should be um, a little bit clearer as far as how we, um, with this image that we get. So now, wait, let me, uh, Let's see now. Now you can see this, and, and this is kind of faint. I mean, I can change the timing on the camera, but you can see the image on the left is 16 images that are integrated. The image on the right is only four images that are in, integrated. And you can see the image on the right, we don't get as clear an image of like this area with the circles and the hole. So the detail over here, we're just, and we're collecting for a longer time because we're not using a lot of electrons. And that's just a, function of dark field. So now I'll go back and I'll say default. And so it's gonna fix that for me. So if I wanna go back to bright field, I can just come back here. I mean, even see at higher mag how this is affecting things. Now I'll move in the vertical direction. Maybe you'll we'll get some different reflections. Yeah. There we go. Now moving the aperture in the other direction. So it gives you a way of, of looking at particles that are all oriented in along the same direction you know, in a certain phase. So um, make sure we're doing good. Okay, doing good. So <clears throat> now I'm gonna look at something. Oh, this is not gonna not a good grid for it, but it'd be a good grid to show you the concepts, right? So like I said, when I put this grid in, one of the things I notice is that these grid bars are really much thicker. So this is a 300 nanometer mesh. And if you remember from my presentation, as we tilt a higher tilts for tomography, the, and in fact, I'll show you what happens. <laughs> so if I go to like, right stage and high tilt, good. So as I tilt higher, I'm gonna tilt in five degree steps. Right now we're at 15 degrees. Now we're at 45 degrees, 50, 55, 60. All right, and it's interesting because you think your grid's flat. If you notice this grid actually has a little bit of a bend to it. But now I would have to actually collect stuff that is in this range of area because these grid bars are gonna come into the field of view. So as I go the other way, there we go. So I'm gonna put this back to zero. So those are the things we have to think about for tomography. And um, <clears throat> that means it was happy. Um, 
So what I'll do is, and I haven't opened this software in a while, so we'll see how it'll do. We can do something probably easy just to show you the concept of how tomography works. <clears throat> and so let me search for a nice, yeah, we'll look at this area here. And not very high mag, so maybe we'll fill up a little bit more. Um, the tomography software we use is Serial M. And then any software like a digital camera, tomography, there's always this handshake of communication. So this is the tomography interface. So, um, so I have also um, low dose control, so I can go into a low dose mode. I've got, um, montage control so that I can actually do a montage. Maybe we'll, we'll do a little bit of that too. And then um, tilt control, just different things. And so I can minimize these and dock them back to the corner. <clears throat> and let's see what the, um, where I'm at. So I have control of my camera. And I can see search mode is continuous. I've got settings for recording. I got I can reference just the center of the tilt axis for focusing. So we'll see here. If I do search, okay. So now we're running live on the camera. And what I'm going to do is uh, I'm going to actually. Um, Here's a little one thing. Yeah, I got it. Should be that. Okay, so I've got this image here, 15,000 X. I'm running live and I go, okay, I kind of like that I'm right here. I'll, I'll be happy with that. So one of the things I want to check, and you know, first I want to make sure I have enough signal, right? So if I move my cursor around, we can see which pixel position down here, and I can see how many counts are in that pixel. So I have balanced it out between, you know, I, do I have good signal to noise or anything? So first thing I want to do is I want to run and set my eccentricity because I want the sample to tilt on axis at all angles. And so we typically can tune the stage up to about a half a micron shift for plus minus 60 degrees. So the software just did a six degree tilt and it's going to walk back through and drop the magnification to 4,000 to get a bigger field of view. Cause you never know if you're really not eccentric, eccentric, the sample may move out of the plane of the field of view. So now it's adjusting our Z height for us. And then it actually tells us right here. It said, oh, okay. It said, I changed the, um, I changed the, uh, where is it? change the Z by three point three and a half microns. Oh, yeah, to 7.3 actually. So the next thing I wanna do is I look back at my image and all this should be somewhat close. Yeah, it's somewhat close where it was. So I'll turn that off. And then my next step in tomography would be to do a fine eccentric ad adjustment. So I'm gonna actually do a plus minus 60 degrees, but it's gonna do six degree steps. And so now it's going to much higher angles and it's going to actually um, adjust the eccentricity to be very uh, fine and on axis. And so now it's at, oh, tilt control, I'm sorry. It's at four, minus four degrees. And this is one of those things, this program does so much. It deals with energy filters. It deals with post-column, in-column energy filters, direct electron cameras, older cameras, newer, all these vendor cameras and when you, it, there's a lot it can do, but when you're doing basic things like just room temperature tomography or something, not low dose, you're doing the same thing. So it's not too big of an issue. No, it's not too difficult to learn once you've done it a couple of times. 
So now I told it to do a find you centric adjustment, but I told it to realign the image. So what it did was it realigned the image back to where it was to compensate for any shift or movement. Now, if I wanted to do my autofocus set here is one micron. <clears throat> so if I want to do an autofocus, I basically just uh, click autofocus. Okay. And it set the focus. So it knows that, okay, that's a good focus. So now I open up my tilt series and I say start. I'm only going to do a quick 20 degrees just to be fast. Um, so this will be here. We'll do 20 degrees, 27 images. Actually, it'll be 21 images. Um, we will okay have just a delay. We're doing a two nanometer pixel. That's decent enough. Um, and then you can see that for this program, I've already set this up and I just I can just run it with what I've done before. I can keep the beam intensity constant, which is one thing we have to consider because as we go to higher tilts, the sample gets thicker, the amount of electrons that get through it, like the question earlier about bright and dark are gonna be dark, not a lot, less electrons are gonna get through it. Um, we also have our autofocus control. Now that's gonna be done at Wonder by micron. Um, is it being still? Um, we can do an, uh, a number of other things. And so we can have it refine use centricity, uh, wait for drift to settle. I'm going to have it track beforehand, but I'm set. I'm going to go. So I'm going to save this as a stack instead of a series of images. And that's just the volume that we're going to work with. And I say gold nano. Articles. There we go. And I save there. And so, um, Sincerely M does this robust prediction. <clears> That's <throat> first, um, the first thing that it's going to do is it's going to take reference images. It's going to say, okay, what's my lower mag image look I'm going to use to actually. If I can't find things right, which is usually more of a higher mega issue, things may jump and your field of view is only a couple hundred nanometers. For this here, our field of view is um, four microns. Yeah, four microns. So <clears throat> this is a this is a pretty large area. Um, but what this will do is it'll actually take images for that lower mag area. It'll take a reference image and I'm starting at zero degrees. So I'm gonna walk up one side, then it's gonna come back to zero and then it'll actually start riding to the other part of the stack to, and as it goes in, in the reverse direction. So it's measuring defocus, it's, it's, it's doing a couple of things. It already saved the first image. Well, let's see what, how that was. So now we've done our first tilt, we're at two degrees. We'll see if the image shifted it on two degrees, not much, but it's gonna shift back. And then it's gonna do, so if you remember, I had this robust prediction. So it's not until the fifth tilt that it's gonna start do this predictive mode where it's gonna actually, you know, it's, it's concerned about speed and dose. It's not trying to get each image to be exactly on, on the same, the same as the other image. Kevin, uh, yeah. I have one request from one of our participants. When you have a chance, could you please 
explain how the uh, movements of the sample are done on TM on sure. the uh, different axes like X, Y, Z, tilting, rotation, and so on. Yeah, let me see where I'm at on here. Oh, program data. Please. Yeah, oh, how the stage moves? Yeah. You know, let me, um, there we go. Sometimes depends on the uh, holder you have, right? Those program data, so, ah, yeah, okay. Yeah, let me just hold on. Bear with me one second. Let me um, go to this. Yeah, Where... when, when you have a chance, no, you don't need to do it right away. Just keep in mind, please. Let's see what this does in yeah, those images are yeah. so so. Um, okay. Okay, the way that this sample is moved is, um, this is one of those things where everybody's a little bit different. So if you look at Joel, we have this actuated um, stage for the more of the coarse mechanical movements. And as we go from like 100X to a million X, the, the, the software slows the stage down so that you know it, it has very, I think it moves in about two nanometer steps is its smallest setting. And then we have a piezo stage on the higher end material scopes where you're doing a lot more atomic resolution. And, and those will have a sub stage like a piezo stage. Now, Hitachi's got a linear actuated stage. It's nice and, and pretty precise, but at low mags, it, it just goes wee and moves. You can hear it screaming as it moves around. <clears throat> um, and, um, but, but, and then their, their stages are jewel tips. So it's still actually, it, their stage mates with a beryllium cup. Whereas us and Thermo, we just are cantilevered out. And so, um, which gives us more flexibility in building stages that are thinner and stuff because you don't have that pressure. FEI or Thermo's got these things with these chopsticks on the cryo stuff. I don't really know how that works. Um, but there's things you can do too. Like instead of using the stage, I could use image shift and. Yeah, I'm gonna pause this right here because it's not really a great image. Oh, I go to, so I'm gonna terminate the tilt series, close file, no. And then uh, search, go up. So one of the things I can do here is I can pause the image and I can say, okay, give me a, a quick image. And then I could actually take my right mouse and I can, let's say, I wanna look at this one. I'll move it to center, take another image. Let me see. Not too bad. Um, the way that we actually calibrate these things, I haven't used this for six months, but it looks like it's still good. Um, yeah, so if I go live and do a search, right? So you can see here, actually, let me get out of this. Um, but this is how tomography works. It just, it tilts, it's, it's, the data is interesting, but it's just, you know, watching it's not the best. It's, um, here, there. Okay. So one of the things I want to do is go back over here and I'm going to take another background. Then I'll show you kind of what the stage, um, how the stage works actually. Let me, um, Oops. Quick reference background. And that should be good. Uh, ooh, no. More. Oops. Saturated. So I'm just taking another background just to optimize things. Um, 
and then I can show you the stage because I'll show you in the software how it looks when it um, you select because um, we have a course button on the trackball. Um, I don't know if you can see me, but the course button is right. It's lit right now. And besides that, there's actually um, three other speeds besides um, Okay. So let's say I'm like right here, right? So if you're looking at the software, the um, you can see the stage right here and there's like these little play buttons and the little play buttons change the speed of the stage. So if I zoom up to like, let's go. Uh, okay, so let's go around 30,000 X. And right now I'm gonna move the trackball just back and forth, right? This is uh, with one tick here and that's how far it moves, right? So we're seeing something move maybe, I can do it down by the micron bar, right? So this is 200 nanometers. So the trackball moves about 300, 400 nanometers. I hit course. And now I move the same uh, amount with the trackball and it moves a lot more than that, right? So now I go back to uncourse, but I can change this to two ticks. And now it's twice the distance or twice the speed, whatever. If I go to three, it becomes very large mechanical steps. And if I go to course in that, it becomes just huge. So we have a range, but then one of the things that like on the stages, and imagine this back in the day before I started working on TEMs when I was 29, when digital stages were just introduced back in around the 90s, early 90s. <clears throat> and um, before that, I mean, imagine you have the same speed, you have like two speeds, like I think uh, FEI used to make a tool called the Morgani, which was a 100 kV TEM, which competed against our 100 kV. But to keep the cost low, they had a, this mechanical stage that only moved at two speeds, slow and fast. <laughs> and so you can see, so as I, I come down to 4,000 or let's say 1,500, right? I need to be able to navigate around. So I click my course button and I can come down. Now, as I drop way down, the sample allows me to move in a much rap, more rapid and um, fast way. I'm tilted, yeah. So then as I zoom up, I take the course button off. And, and this is another thing, I have to refocus because the grid's not flat. And so as I move from square to square, I may have minor focuses, but if I move from edge of the grid to edge of the grid, you might have some large focal variations. <clears throat> and so now I'm at 60,000 X, right? Or 80,000. So now, the stage, I move it back and forth and I'm moving just a very tiny bit because the software is telling the stage we're at higher mag, use smaller um, steps. So now as I go up to a quarter million X, I can at least move the sample. It makes all these minor adjustments, right? So. Throughout the mag range, the, the microscope compensates for illumination intensity and stage movement. And most of the most of the controls. So, and, and a good way to think of that actually is, so I showed you just a little bit about what an imaging filter does. And when they're post column, they tend to be, um, the magnification jump from your screen to the back of the spectrometer is about 20, 25 times. So it's a huge mag change. And so if you're at 10,000 X on the, on your microscope, you're a quarter million X on the energy filter. The, we had to create a eels mode, which drops the mag, but makes the stage controls move very fine. And Itachi, Phillips, Thermo, whatever, um, Joel, all did this correction, I think in the nineties. So and then um, 
so the stages are, I mean, it's great. And so it's just, they're getting, they're, they're better and better. And it was software to compensate for what's going on. If you saw that Axon video at the end of my presentation, <clears throat> when you're doing in situ stuff, things are heating, cooling, moving, and all these things are going on. But software now and cameras are high speed enough that they can compensate for that issue. So, um, yeah. And then I think, I mean, the last, when I installed the tomography here, I did this, let's see if it's on the desktop. I took this just as a test. So this is a quarter micron latex spheres on a gold palladium sphere. Can you see this, Paul? Oh, well. Yes, Kevin, yeah. Oh, okay. Not now. Not now, I just need to turn it down. It's gone. It's gone. There we go. Okay. And so unless anybody else really um, has anything they want to do, I mean, we've gone over what single crystal, and this is a polycrystalline, but we can get kind of a single crystal by dealing with just one particle. Um, be nice if we had a uh, one nanometer probe to walk around and check things. We've looked at convergent beam Im imaging and how thickness affects that. Um, we did a little bit of fake dark field by just displacing the objective aperture to kind of focus on part of the diffraction pattern to look at what particles were in that orientation were coming from where we selected. Um, we looked at a little bit of tilt um, tomography and then um, just to see how that setup was. And then really the, only, I mean, I could do, I think kind of some of the last stuff that I could do is <clears throat> the software montaging. So this is a Joel camera. It's a high sensitivity, high speed camera, but it's only four megapixels. So what do you do if you want a higher resolution image than um, four megapixels, right? Well, what we can do is we can take an image set, which is three by three, and it'll go down and do the next row. It'll go down to the next row. And then we can actually um, combine all those images into a higher resolution photograph. So you can see in the upper part right here how it's not aligned yet. And so you have some of the particles are being cut. And that seems to be all the way down in both images. <laughs> but when this is finished, it's going to actually then stitch all that back together. And now it'll, you'll see it there, it stitches it all back together. And then we end up with the final, um, the final image is, let's see, 34 megapixels, I think. It's a five, 6K by 6K image now versus being a 2K by 2K. So now we've got this much higher, um, better image that we can actually then have resolution as we make up on it and look around. Oh, it didn't do very well, but oh, that's the raw data. And so, I mean, there's a lot of things that I can show you on the microscope, but you know, it's I wanted to make this whole thing really about techniques and applications, and not necessarily about just Joel. And um, I mean, all the data is from Joel and everything that I've done, but uh, it's, uh, I think I think this is kind of a good stopping point to see if we have any questions and then just wrap things up. Because I think you guys have to discuss also the, the Cancun meeting as well. Thank you, Kevin. Um, I have been answering uh, several questions on the chat. Yeah. I believe there is nothing maybe uh, pending, but uh, let's give a chance to everyone or anyone to make uh, any question by voice. Is that okay? Yeah, no problem. So you, I, that was your last sample, right? So you, we are yeah, almost yeah. done? I mean, yeah. I, have, I have hundreds of samples here of asbestos <laughs> and stuff. Wait. I actually had a nice semiconductor samples that Fishio made for me, but I, I accidentally broke them. Yeah, I think uh, it's a good time to 
stop here. So let me check if anyone have any question. Thank you, Kevin. Yeah. Alguien, con toda confianza que... Oh, here's one. What is, what is the line that appears like a stick? That's, yeah. <laughs> you know, it's funny. That's what's called a beam stop. And so you only put it in for diffraction to block out that really high intensity beam from sitting on the camera for too long. And you know, it's funny, that stick is actually a piece of pencil lead. So it's carbon. <laughs> That's right. 0.7 Thank millimeter. You, Kevin. Yeah, actually that was of the uh, missing questions. Alguien que quiera eh, con toda confianza manifestar alguna pregunta adicional, algún comentario. Con toda confianza, por favor. Eh, creo que Aranza. Uh, Aranza Orquídea. Yeah. Aranza, ¿tienes todavía por ahí alguna pregunta? Ella, ella fue yeah. la que preguntó del, de la barra que es el beam stopper. Es para fijar el punto para hacer el patrón de difracción. Ok, um, thank you for answering and thank you so much for teaching us. Um, and my question is about all this time that we were watching the sample and and you were like size sized it. Yeah. Um, the um, the sample was irradiated with the diffraction electron all this time or not? Um, you, you know, I I didn't blank the beam. I mean, one thing that you know that's a great question actually. Um. You know, the cryo world for doing cryo samples, they've been so dose dependent for years that they understand low dose. I mean, they don't want to put more than 10 electrons per inch from squared into their sample. Otherwise, it's dead. It's gone. The structure breaks down. Uh, material scientists are really, I mean, orders of magnitude higher in dose. So you got to think about that. A lot of digital cameras, when you're not imaging, the beam is blank. And only when you lower the screen on the microscope does it come back. So what are the, a lot of the future advances are going to be minimizing beam on the sample when it doesn't need to be there. I mean, that's... <clears throat> so, uh, yeah, the beam was on the sample the whole time. And then I can measure on the live image or the frozen image. Okay, thank you. Sure. And then somebody had questions about measuring D spacings in digital micrograph. Um, there's a thing called diff pack, um, but I could send you, depending on your version of digital micrograph, I can send you a plugin that would allow you to probably measure stuff. Thank you, Kevin. Actually, I asked this uh, person to send me an email. Yeah, he's so we can share information with him, right? Yeah. Excellent. Uh, ¿Alguna otra pregunta, colegas? ¿Algún comentario? Por favor, con toda confianza. Uh, actually, there is one question that I'm not so familiar with this, Kevin. It's, the question said, how can I get the caustic image for SA, selected area diffraction alignment? Does that make sense? Um, how can I get the caustic no. image Okay. Or selected, I mean, my interpretation. Yeah, my interpretation of that would be maybe um, kind of two things, right? You get the diffraction pattern by inserting a um, the selected area aperture, which is the lower aperture in the on the intermediate lens area, and you select an area, and then diffraction is just moving the back focal plane onto the camera, right? And we do that by pushing diffraction mode. Now, if you want to look at kind of a caustic image, just go to diffraction and don't don't use a selected area aperture, because then you end up looking at like this huge thing, and then you have to take your illumination and spread it all the way out, or spread it, just spread it around, and the caustic image will pop up. But do it on a viewing screen, not on a camera, depending on which camera you have. Okay, we have another question. Says. What are the, uh, the important considerations you need to think by analyzing biological samples like bacteria? <laughs> ah, okay. I tried doing a lot of EDS analysis. Um, we published a paper actually on um, mapping biological 
materials and it was Northwestern with a special dedicated STEM years ago. And what they did is it was the, they added, um, they had a large EDS detector on it and they were trying to map out what chemicals start life, right? So when an egg fertilizes the, um, well, the sperm fertilizes the egg, what, what chemicals initiate cell division, right? So they would, they would freeze that point in time and they were trying to analyze. And I think it was like phosphorus, maybe calcium. The big problem though, is if you're trying to analyze stuff that you've embedded in maybe resin and then cut is the whole dehydration process and um, prep process for biological samples it strips a lot of the metals out. So analysis sometimes is really difficult. The best way to really do analysis for biological prep or do biological prep for analysis is to use high pressure freezing. Okay, I think uh, when he mentioned, sorry, analysis, he's not mentioning a particular EDS, but uh, just to make an image, to get an image in case of biology samples in general. Oh, okay. Uh, the considerations you have oh, it's, to cell science. It, it, the typical procedure is glutaraldehyde and osmium. Osmium is, is stain as well. That it stains the material and block for lipids and more or less like uh, cell walls and things. Um, you use different post stains for that. So you basically fix your sample. If you don't have time after maybe somebody's in surgery and you pull a piece of tissue out, it goes into a buffer that's kind of neutral. And then you take it back to the lab. That then goes into um, uh, fixative. And then we dehydrate it and we embed it. And then we section it after it's, the, the resin is um, cooked. And then we cut thin sections. And we can tell from the color of light that's reflect, refracted off of the sections that are cut how thick it is. And then, um, then we can image. And that's standard. It's just standard biological preparation. Thank you, Kevin. Yeah. ¿Alguna otra pregunta o comentario, por favor? De otra manera, no sé, eh, Mariela, si quieran retomar. Um, hello. Uh, good, good, ah. good morning. Good, good afternoon. No, good morning, uh, Mr. Kevin. About the knock-on damage. Um, yeah. Is it related with also the width of the sample that I am analyzing? No, it's, it's purely knock on damage is purely a physical thing. If I was doing this on my computer, I have a chart, a paper that somebody wrote that shows the knock on threshold for most, most elements actually. And so it's mainly just the, the physics of the lower Z, the more knock on damage you tend to have. So carbon, like nanotubes, graphene, um, carbon materials have a threshold around 70 kV. So that's why you see I had those 60 kV uh, nanotube images. And because you can look at them, they just won't break down. Okay. Yeah, Thank so that's, that's, that's not a function of the size of the sample. Now, the size okay. of the sample may be thermal damage, right? Because okay. the, beam will, the beam will interact more and hang out more in the sample. Okay, thank you. Sure, you're welcome. Muchas gracias. Pues creo que el tiempo se nos está agotando. No sé si nuestros colegas de la Sociedad Mecánica de Materiales quisieran eh, retomar la comunicación. Por ahí yes, um, tenemos alguna hello? información. Adelante. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Okay, uh, I'm Gerardo Rojas. I currently collaborate with the Sociedad Mexicana de Materiales. And first of all, I want to congratulate Dr. Kevin for this rewarding workshop. Oh, thank, thank you, you. Dr. Kevin. Oh, thank you. And, oh, yes. Well, in order to make the registration for attending to this course and the attendance certificates, you have to access to the link that will will show in uh, chat room. Uh, can you see the uh, yeah link? And also let you know once again that I have typed a few times in this meeting chat also our website and our different social networking sites. 
if you need information about the International Materials Research Congress that will take place in Cancun in, in August. So I think that's it. Thank you so much. Mm. Wow. And that's a huge meeting. I love that meeting. Yes. Yes. We it all will be, are very it will be hybrid. Be it will be to hybrid too. I'd say for the size of the meeting, that's about the best organized meeting in the world, probably. Because it's huge. It's bigger than the American Society meeting. But it's Cancun, <laughs> yeah. right? <laughs> yeah, it is. Mary. Well, thanks, thanks again, doctor. And the information is right now in the chat meeting. Thank you, doctor. Great. All right. Thank you. Eh, de mi parte, en nombre de Yol, pues queremos agradecer primeramente, Kevin, thank you so much for your time yeah. and your great lecture. We really appreciate all your preparation. Uh, agradezco muchísimo a todos los asistentes. Realmente para nosotros es muy importante la promoción de la microscopía electrónica. Bueno, pues creo que eh, el interés que han mostrado todos eh, pues le da un sentido muy especial al curso. Le agradezco a la doctora Zambrano, a, a Mariela, eh, al doctor Jesús González, que por ahí también está. Eh, gracias por la colaboración con la Sociedad Mexicana de Materiales. Y bueno, pues esperamos eh, seguir colaborando y, y organizando eh, cursos más adelante. Les mando un fuerte abrazo y, y cedo la palabra con gusto a la doctora Zambrano. Oh, ok, thanks, thanks, Leopoldo. Um, this is a uh, uh, this is a diploma for Kevin for your your excellent presentation, excellent, excellent course. Is Thank you. From STEM, STEM. Thanks, uh, thanks, Kevin. Uh, I nice to to know you and and uh, see you in Cancun maybe in August. Every two years. <laughs> Every two years I go. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we have a, a um, you have in the in the the Congress um, presentation, um, Mariela and um, Francisco. Nati, puedes, eh, can you talk about the the congress? Which one? The yes, the this one? only uh, okay. Only invite to the people to the access submission at, at the yes, at the course. International Materials Research Congress that is in Cancun at the in, in August. Uh, it is place you in is a place to invite you to submit abstract to the this congress. This is the congress of the society. In the past Congress, we have maybe so, so 1,700 attendees from nearly uh, 60 countries. And we will be very happy to have your participation. The Congress is scheduled uh, from August uh, 15 to 20. Uh, and, in, and the Congress is a, in, a, in a hybrid format. And you connect or you uh, uh, stay, in, uh, go to Cancun for the Congress. Uh, is is uh, see you uh, see you in Cancun if you want to to go to the to to the Congress and the at the moment the at the abstract is open the the to be abstract is open is open to March uh, 19 um uh, please if you want to participate in the Congress send you you your abstract thank you for the participation in the in this course. Uh, Nati? Yes. Oh, well, uh, again, we invite you to the 20th International Material Research Congress that will take part to in Cancun, Mexico. And 50 until 20 of August, we they're still um, receiving abstracts. Remember that it's in hybrid event if you're still um, scared about COVID <laughs> and not sure about the sanitary regulations, you could still attend the event online. But if not, you can still go to Cancun, which is not bad because it's Cancun. <laughs> um, 
Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Zambrano. Uh, thank you very much to doc, Dr. Kevin for this very interesting information. I would like to thank Geol Mexico for the technical support in the organization on this course, uh, in special uh, engineer Leopoldo. Uh, last but not least, I thank the Sociedad Mexicana de Materiales for the support along this activity. The student chapter of Simvestap Zacatenco acknowledge your attention to this course. Thanks very much. We invite you to get involved in all the activities. Thanks guys, it was wonderful working with you. Really appreciate the time. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin. We appreciate Thanks. it. Great course. Thank you for your time. Mm -hmm. Hopefully we'll see you in Cancun on ours. <laughs> Yeah, sure. Oh, yeah. Uh, sure. First bottle of tequila is on me. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, another thing, just to remind you, the, the image that you're seeing right now is our students chapter Congress, it's small Congress. And if you want a scholarship for the Congress of the Mexican Association in Cancun, you can participate in this symposium. And if you win, you could get uh, this full paid scholarship. But remember that you need to be a member of our student chapter, which is still open the registration for membership until March 16th. And that would be all. It's all Thank you for your time. Muchas gracias nuevamente para todos. Reciban un fuerte abrazo y especial agradecimiento nuevamente Mariela, doctora Zambrano. Mil gracias por su atención. Thank gracias. You, Thank, Thank you, you, Kevin. Thank you. Goodbye. Bye, guys. I'll talk Until to you later, Paul. Thank you, sir. Take Thanks. care. Thank you. Gracias Hasta a todos. Buenas tardes. Goodbye. Bye.